Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kate Ford, and at 4.34 p.m. on September, no, on October 12, 2021, I'm calling to order this regular meeting of Santa Barbara Unified School Board. As it states on the agenda, due to the changes required in Assembly Bill 361, the public may call in to the meeting in real time by raising their hands during the each separate agenda item, raising their hands on Zoom. Therefore, if there are members of the public who want to speak to an agenda item only from closed session, please raise your hand on Zoom now. Ms. Trujillo, are there any members of the public who wish to comment on closed session? No public comment on closed session. Thank you very much. I'll wait another few seconds in case anything changes. Hearing no changes, thank you. We will now adjourn to closed session in the Anna Kappa room and return to open session at 5.30. Board and we have concluded closed session this evening. It is Tuesday, October 12, 2021 at 5.38 p.m. And I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School, uh, School District School Board. And now for information about interpretation for this meeting. Thank you, Board President Ford. Good evening. I will give this announcement regarding language interpretation in English and Spanish. Buenas tardes, voy a dar este anuncio sobre la interpretación en inglés y en español. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bidirectional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you do not have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are using a laptop or a desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe now and select English. If you are using an iPad or a phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English and click done. And when it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear and speak at a moderate pace. We, all, we are also offering American Sign Language ASL interpretation for this meeting. If you will be using ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom app on your computer, tablet or phone to join this meeting. If you joined this meeting through your web browser, you may not be able to see the ASL interpreter at all times. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí ahora y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o su teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas, elija español y finalizar. O si está en inglés, dice done. Y recuerde, cuando sea su turno de hablar, hable con voz fuerte y clara y a un paso, paso moderado. Gracias. Thank you. We may now begin. Thank you. Now, Dr. Maldonado, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and raise the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we'll proceed now going back to Dr. Maldonado and your request. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, we have reconsidered our item on action agenda item number seven, the request for a school resource officer. We would like to move that item to a discussion item for tonight's meeting. We need some time to uh, gather additional information to bring to this board, but we will give you a report under the discussion report items. Your reason for requesting this change is that you need more information and perhaps more community input. We have gotten several questions that we think we need to gather more input from other uh, members of the community, as well as for some of the questions that were asked by board members. So it's both and. 
That sounds just fine. We will move it from being an action item to a report and discussion item. Thank you. Continuing on with number five, there was one action taken in closed session, and this was the action. By a unanimous vote, five to zero, the board rejected the public claim of all items within the past six months as stated in the claim made by Howard Taylor in the letter dated September 28, 2021. The motion was made by Ms. Alvarez and seconded by Ms. Munoz. Also, uh, three student issues were discussed in closed session and they will be voted on in open during the action agenda item section. Uh, for the for the public, a reminder that tonight the school will be in person wearing masks as mandated by Santa Barbara County Public Health for the month of October. And the public may participate through live streaming. Thank you for your patience. We'll continue now with the meeting. I want to review again the changes that are a result of Assembly Bill 361 with regard to public comment. Uh, as I mentioned, public speakers no longer need to pre-register to address items on the agenda. Per AB 361, members of the public wishing to speak must raise their hands, quote unquote, in the Zoom webinar platform by, by selecting the virtual hand icon during the presentation of that item. And they may do so at any time when uh, public comment remains open for that item. When persons are called on to speak, their microphone will be activated by district staff and the speaker will be notified that they can now unmute themselves in order to begin speaking. The speaker will then need to unmute themselves by selecting the mute unmute icon and state your name at the beginning of your comment, please. Also, if you're joining by phone, please raise your hand by dialing star nine. When persons are called on to speak, their microphone will be activated by district staff and the speaker will be notified that they can now unmute themselves in order to begin speaking. The speaker will then need to unmute themselves by dialing star six and state your name at the beginning of your comment too, please. Tonight, public comments will be limited to two minutes each, and we will all do our best to make sure this new system runs smoothly and efficiently, and thank you again for your patience. The COVID-19 report will be in a few minutes at 6 p.m., and the board will take a 10-minute break after about two hours. Uh, at approximately 7 p.m., we'll have a public hearing to review the three conceptual trustee maps dividing the district into five areas. This is the first presentation, and the public and the board will have an opportunity to reflect on these maps. So now, let's continue with number six. Dr. Maldonado, your report to the board, please. Thank you once again, Board President Ford. Good afternoon, board members, staff, and members of the public. Next slide, please. On Monday, October 11th, we recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. That was yesterday. I'd like to uh, have you join me in honoring the Chumash people, their elders, their culture and history, and all of the contributions Indigenous people continue to make in our communities. I also want to remind us that October is National Principles Month. We love our principles in Santa Barbara Unified and thank them endlessly for everything they have done, continue to do, and will do so in the future to keep all our students uh, safe and in school. Day in and day out, evenings and weekends, they care for our students and lead our staff. We will be planning a special recognition for them next Thursday, but please join us in thanking our principals in your own special way. Next slide. We are happy to report that moving forward in our partnership with County Public Health and Cottage Health, we will continue to offer second dose vaccinations at our secondary sites. We will also be including flu shots, as well as additional first dose shots for people who would like to have those at these clinics. Reminder that you don't need an appointment and these are completely free to anyone, both uh, members of our schools and to the public. Next slide. Our high school principals and staff shared that their, home, their homecomings were all successful and well attended as outdoor events this year. There was something unique that they all shared this year for the first time. 
start again. There was something unique that they all shared this year for the first time. They all held gender neutral, uh, all gender homecoming courts. And we are glad that we were all staying safe while still, still continuing some of these beautiful traditions we have in our high schools. And I do wanna thank um, our high school staffs and administrators for all the extra time and care it takes to put on these additional events for our students on top of everything else that they do. Next slide. As we close out Hispanic Heritage Month, I'm delighted to share with you this evening the story of two Santa Barbara Unified Sisters who serve as a wonderful reminder that with every challenge comes an opportunity. Aliyah Rubio, age 13, who attends La Colina Junior High, and her sister, 11-year-old Bella Rubio, who attends Peabody Charter School, are the founders of the Youth Makers Market, a community pop-up that is empowering kids under age 18 to become young entrepreneurs by creating and selling their own crafts and goods, another form of art. Bella began harvesting honey and also making hair accessories. Aliyah started crafting jewelry, bracelets, necklaces, rings, and anklets. That led to their first youth makers market last month where they were joined by 17 other young artists, chefs, jewelry makers, and other talents. Here's a quick video clip of that first event, which by the way, was covered by all the local news outlets. Sandra, may you please play the video? Sandra, I'm gonna have the students speak and then you'll let me know when the video is ready. Uh, I wanna welcome Aliyah and Bella who are here tonight along with their mom, Ceci Rubio, a Santa Barbara High Don herself, uh, and two other contributors to the market. Jack, a six-year-old who makes tie-dye t-shirts, and Emma, 17, who creates backdrops, eyelashes, and eyeshadow palettes. Aliyah and Bella, tell us about how your idea came to be and how is it going? I started making jewelry to sell. One social. second, let me make sure your mic is on. As you can tell, we have... Now it's up. yeah. I started making jewelry on social media. I started making jewelry to sell on social media due to the pandemic because I had no other outlet. We went around our county with our parents to farmers and makers markets. I began to harvest honey due to the pandemic too. It was something I love to do all the time, so I love honeybees. We noticed there were no youth makers market anywhere. We told our parents about this plan and it has grown ever since. We have youth, we have youth. We have youth signing up from out of Santa Barbara. The impact on the youth makers market has been unexplainable. It has empowered and inspired a ton of youth all over the county. We want we want the next generation to follow, to have an outlet, to feel that this is for us, by us, and to empower us. We would like to invite you, your family, and friends to our next pop-up this Sunday, October 17th, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., 631 Garden Street. Thank you for having us. Can we give them a night? Yes. I want to I wanna remind us that we are here for students. We exist because of our students. And this is a beautiful uh, way for our students to remind us of the, the opportunities that we can take in spite of having a, being in the middle of a pandemic. I love that you girls found a way to make something powerful happen, but also express yourselves and take the things that you love and turning them into something that all of us can enjoy by coming to the market also, but allowing other students like yourselves to join. So thank you for being role models for us on ways to keep healthy and for us to think about opportunities that are presented to us during this, these challenging times. Sandra, will we be able to see the video or perhaps if not, we can post it on our website for others to see it?
Thank you once again. And uh, we are happy to report that we will be able to get a little taste of their honey as well as a look at some of their jewelry, along, of course, with an announcement for their next market. One last slide, board members. Um, I do want to announce that next Monday, October 18th, is our student free day, which we uh, had in our calendar. It's a professional development day for our teachers. All certificated staff will be at San Marcos High School. And some of the topics that we will be discussing and working on will be some of the implementation of some of our SBUSD initiatives. As you know, we have initiatives around language, literacy, and mathematics, significant disproportionality, and so on. We have strengthening the learning of emergent multilingual learners. We're still staying on that topic. We're going to follow up with some more um, sessions for the teachers. We have a keynote speaker, Nancy Fry, who's going to be talking to our teachers about engagement and clarity when they're teaching. Um, we're also going to be having sessions around the uh, FOSS kits with integrated ELD, designated ELD assessments, um, reflective practices for content learning and language development. And in secondary, we'll also be looking at sessions around uh, refining common assessments, the use of rubrics, uh, sessions, for example, one of them is titled, Do I Reteach or Move On in Mathematics? Um, understanding the why, what, and how of a re-engagement lesson among some of them, um, some of the topics. The PE teachers will also have training on CPR. Uh, and also our administrators will have additional sessions on uh, transitioning from a zero tolerance school climate to a response to behavior school climate as a result of the passing of your, of your and our policy around uh, student uh, response to behavior. So I just wanna thank all the teachers and staff who've been preparing the TOSAs and, and administrators who've been preparing for next Monday's um, event. And that concludes my report to the board. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Maldonado. Thank you, especially for introducing us to the Makers Market Founders and the recognition of Principals Month. Principals, we really love and honor you. Uh, Ms. Munoz has asked for a special permission of a short comment. Oh, I was just going to say that um, I know the mom, um, Ceci Rubio, of the little girl, the not so little girls anymore that started the Youth Makers Market. And just remarkable. I'm glad. Thank you so much for inviting them. I knew them when they were this big. <laughs> That's wonderful. So before we go on to the COVID report, I would like to congratulate one retiree tonight, Catherine Young, the elementary office manager at Roosevelt Elementary School, retires with 20 plus years of service to our district. So on behalf of the board, Catherine, we wish you a wonderful retirement filled with much deserved rest, relaxation, good health, and hopefully lots of good fun. Um, and so now I'd like to move to the COVID-19 report number 29. Dr. Wagenick. Good evening, Dr. Maldonado, President Ford and Board. Here, as President Ford said, with uh, COVID-19 report number 29. Um, next slide, please. So just a quick reminder to those watching, as well as the board, that all of our work related to COVID um, centers around these five key factors that were identified um, in May of 2021. I'll be speaking tonight about some of those, including tr community transmission, vaccines, comprehensive testing, um, and some um, matters related to research and understanding. Next slide, please. So here we have um, what I consider to be very encouraging news, and that is that the um, case rate per 100,000 people uh, continues to drop in our county. Um, as of the 7th of October, our case rate was just 
in excess of 11 per 100,000. I will tell you that a case rate of six per 100,000 is um, what both local and state governments are looking to in terms of lessening mask requirements and other requirements. And so uh, just as we were watching these case rates last year, as we were wanting to go from red to orange to yellow, um, we're watching that again and getting closer and closer. Um, next slide, please. And then vaccinations by age. I think uh, even though the, the county public health doesn't um, select their age groups the same way we would like them to be um, uh, grouped, uh, we can get an idea of how we're doing. And so right now we're at, in the county in excess of 60% of those ages 12 to 15 are vaccinated. And you can see that those ages 16 to 29 um, are in excess of 70%, um, heading towards 75%. Uh, we are still uh, really pushing this week in our secondary schools to get more data on um, the number of students in our district who are vaccinated. And um, we'll have that data for you, um, hopefully higher rates. And we'll look at that in a minute. Um, at our next board report. But we do have some preliminary data for you. Next slide. And um, this is the data that we're bringing to you in regards to testing and vaccination status. So going from left to right and then down to the uh, bottom, we'll start with students and we'll start with um, elementary students. So as of um, all of this data is as of 3 p.m. last Thursday, the 7th. Uh, every Friday, again, we post our updated dashboard. And so this is, um, and that's as of 3 p.m. on Thursday. So we had 77.2% of our elementary families granting consent to have their children tested in our surveillance testing program. Uh, another nearly 23% or 754 students had not been granted consent by their parents to be tested. This does not mean that we don't continue to work with those families. Some of those families, it's because of um, uh, technology issues. Maybe their own phones are not working. They're not receiving messages. So I do want the board to know the schools are continuing to to dig in and, and find out what the issue is. Um, and there was a conversation today amongst principals of sharing ideas of how they could um, work with their families to get more and more students um, at that consent level that we want. In terms of testing results of, of our total number of uh, elementary students tested, through the surveillance testing, um, that's been 2,560. That's resulted in seven positive cases. It's a very good case rate. Of course, these are asymptomatic tests, and so we would expect a lower um, case rate, but um, those were seven asymptomatic students that were identified. Secondary students, uh, we We've only made a gradual progress in the last two weeks, but this week is a big push by our secondary schools as we move towards um, surveillance testing of unvaccinated students coming up. So 25% um, of students have verified that they are vaccinated and we're awaiting response from another 75%. In terms of employees and their vaccination status, we are now at 91.2% of our employees are fully vaccinated. Another nearly 3% have their vaccination in progress. They've received one vaccination or they've received two vaccinations and they are not yet beyond their two week uh, time period. We have another 81 uh, staff members who are requesting an exemption or deferral 
of their vaccination. That's nearly 5% of our employees. And then still awaiting response from another 20 uh, staff members or 1.2%. Next slide. So um, I know we've seen the Swiss cheese model quite a bit in the last year or so, but I wanted to bring it back because I think uh, over the last 18 months, we've learned a lot about what we need to do to uh, keep, keep COVID out of our schools, keep ourselves healthy. And the, so I want to review the Swiss cheese model, and I want to talk about um, how it really applies now in October of 2021 as compared to a year ago or 18 months ago. And, and specifically as they um, pertain to vaccines. So vaccines are widely regarded as the most powerful weapon in our COVID-19 arsenal. And, and some, um, some vaccines that we have, not just the COVID vaccines are um, but specifically, the COVID vaccines are 90% effective, and they prevent people from getting very sick with the virus and needing hospital care. The numbers show that. The data shows that, that even those who, the 10% who, um, or, or the 10% um, ineffectiveness, those folks don't get as sick. But many of us are hoping that vaccines against uh, coronavirus are going to help us to reclaim our old lives, right? That, that the vaccine will be this magic bullet that solves everything. And really no vaccine is 100% effective. We need to remember that. And, and scientists say that shots alone will not currently be enough to stop the virus from spreading. And other measures are still needed. And I really have had this sense of people sort of loosening up around mitigation. And, and now is not the time to do this if we want to get back to whatever normal is going to be. The problem is that no single measure to prevent the spread of coronavirus is 100% effective. And that includes the vaccine. So if we take a look at, at this block of Swiss cheese or these slices with its characteristic holes, um, each layer represents one of our defenses against the virus. None of those slices are perfect. In fact, the good ventilation and the hand hygiene as represented here are kind of, when they stand alone, the least effective. But when combined with face masks and physical distancing and, and vaccination, which is the most effective, then we really are taking the steps we need to um, be safer. So, you know, it's only by using a number of the slices or the measures that we create the best chance of protecting our students and ourselves and our families and our friends. Australian virologist Ian McKay the first to use the Swiss cheese model or apply it directly in relation to this pandemic, says in reality that the cheese's holes will constantly open, shut, shift location, depending on, the, on behavior, our behavior. So one especially concerning behavior we've been seeing repeatedly is the behavior of spreading misinformation. And so, um, as a result, misinformation mouse has been added to the slices of Swiss cheese. And you see that when misinformation mouse begins eating away at any of the pieces of individual cheese, that creates more room for the virus to spread. Um, I made a point of really focusing on the Swiss cheese model tonight because we have to be even more vigilant in making sure that misinformation about COVID is not spread in our schools and does not dictate our policies. And I want to say, I believe this board does a really good job of making sure that misinformation does not impact what we do in this district. So thank you. Next slide. 
Uh, so now to conclude, um, our state and national COVID news that impacts um, us locally. First, California is going to require COVID vaccines for school children. Governor Gavin Newsom announced on Friday, October 1st, that all California students and school staff will be required to get vaccinated against COVID-19 as soon as it could be January 2022, uh, very likely it will be July 2022. And the mandate, and the nation's first mandate, applies to all students in kindergarten through 12th grade, in public, charter, and private schools, and all school employees. It goes into effect in the first semester, either January or July, following the FDA's full approval of the COVID vaccine for each age group. Only the Pfizer vaccine is fully approved for people 16 and older. The Pfizer vaccine also has emergency authorization for use in children between the ages of 12 and 16. So we are waiting to see what the time frame will be um, in the state of California, uh, depending on when the FDA and if the FDA gives full approval for the different age groups. Next, we have Pfizer BioNTech uh, seeking COVID-19 vaccine clearance for children ages five through 11. Uh, they have asked US regulators to authorize emergency use of the COVID-19 vaccine for children ages five to 11, a group for whom uh, no shot is currently allowed. And finally, um, oh, and on that, the date that the, U the FDA has set is October 26th. That's when their panel of outside advisors will meet and discuss the application. Um, and finally, uh, 120,000 children lost a parent or primary caregiver during the first 15 months of the pandemic in the United States. So over a 15 month period of the pandemic, more than um, 120,000 children um, lost their, the, a primary adult in their lives. A loss that more severely affected racial minorities, according to the modeling study published in the Journal of Pediatrics. The study estimated that for every four COVID deaths, between April 1st, 2020 and June 30th, 2021, one child lost a parent or a caregiver, one in every four deaths. The findings suggested that the ongoing pandemic, which has claimed more than 700,000 American lives thus far, could leave tens of thousands of children dealing with trauma for generations to come. I chose this because as we expected, but perhaps more, I know we expected trauma when our children returned to school. And I want this board to know that that trauma is very real. It's impacting our teachers, our principals every day are spending time with children who are very traumatically impacted by the pandemic. And I know that for many of them, they did lose parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and other people who were close to them. There's a lot of loss and um, that just needs to be known both by the board and I'm sure you, I know you care a lot about that, but I want those who are watching to also know the impact that the pandemic has had on our children and our youth. And by way of that, our teachers and our administrators. So with that, I will um, pause and we probably have public comment. So. Thank you, Dr. Wagenek. Uh, that last fact um, is quite chilling, even given the fact that um, even though we know children are less affected by illness and by death, they are deeply affected by loss. And that's why we have to do our best to mitigate everything that we can and 
in this pandemic. So thank you very much. I do want to remind the board and the public that this is a report item only. We're not voting on anything regarding or, or included in this report. And uh, so now, members of the public, it is time for public comment on this report. Please remember to use your Zoom icon to raise your hands, quote unquote. Ms. Trujillo, now, are there any public comments on this item? Thank you, President Ford. Yes, we do have public comment on this item. I will go ahead and call on the first five names or five names at a time so that people can be ready. And I will start with the first five. Anne Thomas, Claudia Henry, Justin Shores, Leslie Sanderson. And please, when I unmute your, um, give you access to speak, will you please state your name? Thank you. Anne Thomas. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. This is, this is Ann Thomas. Dear Superintendent Maldonado and members of the school board, like many parents, I am relieved to see that the Delta wave numbers are dropping radically and it appears that it will soon be behind us. I would like to congratulate you on how you have been able to keep the kids in and the virus out of the schools during this challenging period. Some data you have yet to share with us parents, though, is how many of the district kids and teachers who tested positive for COVID this year were already vaccinated. As you very well know, vaccinated students and teachers can still get infected with the virus and infect others around them. We as parents deserve to have that information. Why are you not sharing this? While it may be inconvenient to share that some vaccinated students and teachers tested positive for COVID, it is valuable information to share with parents. I would also like the board to revisit their decision on the resolution to mandate the COVID vaccine to all teachers and staff with no option to test. This resolution will result in some teachers losing their current job and students losing their teachers. This carries huge implications for the teachers and the students alike. Students have been struggling through the past year and a half, both academically and emotionally. They're finally back in the classroom full-time this year and teachers are doing an amazing job at building their confidence back up and catching them up on their studies. Thank you. But now this board will throw a new blow at our students by destabilizing their school year once again, not because of the threat of the virus, but because of a decision from this board. Students will pay a dear price for this and add to their trauma. Their school year will be greatly impacted by this. Who will replace those teachers? How qualified are they? How dedicated are they? Who are they? Where are they? What's your plan? If you truly care about the students, I urge you to keep the teachers in their current position. Do not remove them from their current classrooms. Continue to test them on a regular basis and test the vaccinated ones as well while you're at it. But please do not disturb the school year one more time, this time for the sake of a resolution that was rushed and not needed. Do it for the children, do it for the parents, do it for the teachers. Time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Claudia Henry. Hello, this is Claudia Henry. Um, yes, I'm listening to um, the board here about the tragedy of COVID. I really don't think that is news. I think the whole country knows this. It's been a suffering across the board. I think what parents like me and teachers are concerned with is that we are living in a perpetual state of emergency. So while you're concerned about, um, hold on a second, honey, I'm talking on the board. So while you're um, concerned about um, mandating the vaccinations for teachers, we're concerned with these, you know, poor 20 staff members that haven't responded. And then we're concerned that the 81 staff that have requested exemption may not be, you know, properly heard and properly received. I mean, I'm just not sure what number is good enough for the emergency to end for you. 91.2% and 3% in progress. That sounds like enough, uh, enough to just calm the emergency down. You guys can help with the crisis by stopping the testing, by promoting early treatment and early prevention that are not in the Swiss cheese slices, which would be really good to see. We need to educate the children to educate their parents about vitamin D, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
I just think we can do better as a community. And I would ask you to withdraw the mandate on the teachers and don't even think about mandating it on the students. We need to stand up to this. It's not safe when there's risk. Thank you. Our next speaker is Justin Shores. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so one thing uh, the the board isn't isn't talking about at all is the the how a lot of people that are vaccinated now are really getting this this virus and spreading it. In fact, right now, fourteen out of fifteen of the deaths in Vermont over the last two weeks were all vaccinated adults. So that that is a really incredible stat, um, given the fact that you're mandated vaccines on our staff. Um, it seems that that vaccine is outdated. And unfortunately, with a lot of legis legislation, it, you guys work so slow, you don't catch up to the, the time. So why would we, why would we be forcing a, an outdated vaccine that's not working? Uh, in Israel right now, they're the most vaccinated country. They have the second highest rates of infection. And I please, Miss Miss Wagenek, you say that's misinformation. You need to you need to address it. Then prove me wrong. Are we the rats? Are we the rats out here that are just giving you facts? Are you trying to make us like we're we're vermin because we're trying to understand where you're coming from? This isn't right. You guys need to stop using the the same exact rhetoric from all the other boards and start digging in yourselves. Start looking at the real situation in each in each scenario. Um, it, you look like fools, for one. All of you do. Um, I think you should you should stop. You should start to look at our community. Start to listen to our community members. You think that we're not part of this, but we are, and we're not going to go away. We are going to keep coming. We're going to keep talking to you until you some somehow you listen. Maybe you'll get taken out of office somehow. Maybe we'll find something on you that we can spread around in the, in the community and find out where really the skeletons are with these, these, these people that are pushing all this with us for no reason. This is not needed. This is too late. You need to stop it. Start educating our kids instead of forcing all this crap on us. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Leslie Sanderson. Hello, this is Leslie Sanderson. I just had a comment about the board report tonight. I noticed that we're not including um, the positive, total positive cases of both students and staff um, in this board report. I did look at it online, which showed that there were 17 students this week and two staff that were positive. I do think it would be helpful um, to know who was vaccinated, who was unvaccinated, especially if you're planning on encouraging vaccines. I also have noticed um, and have had people tell me that they're receiving messages from their school on a daily basis of positive tests. And um, some schools have even said it's considered an outbreak um, because there's been over seven students from different households that have uh, uh, shown positive. Um, I'm just curious if the the um, this type of information is going to change our response to what we're doing as far as uh, COVID tracing and contact tracing, um, because of course we know from Ms. Wagonek's report that it's not just the students that are ending up positive that might not uh, be definitely sick, but they're taking COVID home to their families and their family members are ending up in the hospital. So I was just curious as to uh, when that information would be available to the general public. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jamie Devin. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, thanks for having me speak tonight. Um, I guess the first thing I just wanted to address is the misinformation mouse that you guys are using, and I know, I think that first came with the Board of Supervisors, but I, you know, as someone who grew up, who is Jewish, I, I was raised in a Jewish culture and tradition, I think, you know, using that analogy of like a mouse and vermin really has some pretty 
poor ties to history. So, you know, if you don't want to be compared to <laughs> past era and past uh, bad things in history, please don't use the same references. It's kind of offensive. Um, what I really wanted to address tonight is, I'm sure you guys saw the news article that Gavin Newsom didn't vaccinate his 12 year old child for COVID. And I just thought that was really interesting. Um, you know, if these mandates are coming from the top of the, the food chain and down, you know, it kind of doesn't send a good message when the person in charge isn't following his own uh, mandates. And you guys are pressuring as well that this is going to happen. But it's, you know, it's not even being followed by the people that are putting these mandates in place. Um, I know he said that it's because his child hadn't yet received a, another series of vaccinations. But if you guys know the vaccine schedule at age 12, there is no series that is due. It's just one for school, which I believe is the Tdap. So that brings up a question like, is this child not on a delayed vaccine schedule? Are they not having all the vaccines that are necessary for school? It just sounds sends a message of, you know, the elites aren't doing what they're asking us to do. And I think that there's a lot of, you know, non-transparency around this issue of rules for thee and not for me. Um, and if you guys are following from the top down, it would look a lot better optically if they're Hi. actually doing what they're Thank saying. Thank you. The next five speakers are Sarah, Natalie, Nicole Montalvo, Sharon Jagotka, Sonia Beraril. Can you please state your full name, Sarah? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Sarah Anderson. First of all, I want to say that I am a fully vaccinated teacher, and I strongly oppose the teacher mandate to get the vaccine. Each person should be able to make their own decision whether or not to receive this vaccine. In my class, I provide choice of activities because when you provide choice, students are more engaged and willing to cooperate. They don't wanna be forced to do anything. Have you ever forced a student to do anything? It doesn't usually go well. This is why the vaccine needs to be a choice for your own body. Choice is the key word. This vaccine is not a one size fits all and no one truly knows how it will affect their body. Those who have chosen to take the vaccine have taken that risk, risk of death, possibly. There will be people who are not willing to take that risk or take the risk of how, may, how it may affect their body. We all know both vaccinated and unvaccinated can still get and spread COVID. We know this as a fact. So why force people to get the vaccine? Makes no sense. I actually feel safer around the unvaccinated teachers since I know they're getting tested weekly. My vaccinated friends have been the ones contracting COVID. Can you explain that? Have you ever thought that some of these amazing teachers who are well loved by their students might take the vaccine by the teacher state deadline of July, 2022? They don't wanna be forced into do anything, but maybe would choose to take it with more data on the vaccine and its effectiveness. The state's teacher mandate isn't until July, 2022. I have a lot more to say, but I'm running out of time. But when these, when the schools need a sub, maybe they should call all of you first to sub. I bet you couldn't do it. Plan an engaging lesson and be in these classrooms. I dare them to call you to be the sub. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Natalie. Natalie, will you please state your full name? Natalie Campbell, can you hear me? Thank you, go ahead. So I'm gonna address the board for one second and that's it, the rest of it's going to the people hopefully still listening. I find it really curious, you have no planted speakers or are they finally seeing the truth that you are lying and they're not interested in your agenda anymore because it's disgusting. Fact check what is presented to you, everybody listening. Do your own research, parents and caregivers. The board won't change course, so we must and stand up for our children and the brave teachers who are the line of defense for our kids. This vaccine is not safe. Everybody is lying to us. Our public health department is corrupt and possibly clueless, I don't know, 
but the orders are coming from up top and they're not going to stop listening. They're not going to change course. We must fight. I know more people who have been affected dramatically by this vaccine than were ever touched by COVID. Everyone I know who had COVID recovered and this has got to stop. This board is not going to ever, ever care about the safety of our children, nor our teachers, nor our community. They only care about where they're sitting with their masks behind that desk, behind the doors. They're afraid of us and they should be because we are big in numbers and we're growing every single day. Next speaker is Nicole Montago. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. So um, before I start, I do want to touch on a point that was made at the last meeting. There was a request that accommodations be made for those who do not have Zoom available. There was a suggestion made to perhaps have a microphone out here in our beautiful and ever so cozy parking lot since we are not allowed in the public building in which you sit. And we would just very much appreciate steps being taken toward actual interaction. The Board of Supervisors meets every week with in-person public comment and there is no reason that the school board can't do the same. So yes, my name is Nicole Montalvo. Yes, that Nicole Montalvo. Hilda, I'm sure that you recognize my name. I have been a thorn in your inbox since before the school year began. There are many, many concerns that we have as parents, especially when it comes to your leadership skills and your ability to protect our kids. You are continually proving to us that you are not trustworthy. And there is nothing more frightening to a parent than not having faith in the people who are tasked with caring for our children. So since we have such a short window to speak, I will address just one of my many concerns. At the meeting two weeks ago, a very brave teacher within the district spoke up about skeletons that you have tucked away. And those revelations are not sitting well with parents. We learned that a custodian who was reported for sexual harassment was transferred instead of disciplined. You had an opportunity to protect your staff and students from a sexual predator. And instead you protected him. That's disgusting. I have several friends with children who are enrolled at Roosevelt where the custodian now works and they are livid that there is a predator on campus with their babies. What are you waiting for? What will it take? Are you waiting for him to attack a staff member or a student before you consider him a real threat? Also two weeks ago, a teacher at San Marcos was arrested for sending explicit photos to a student. I'm... Next speaker is Sharon Jagotka. Sharon Jagotka. Go ahead. Hi, um, tonight I'm just really gonna just speak from my heart. There's a couple of things that I wanna ask um, Hilda. And that question is, who's the boss, Hilda? Are you the boss? Or is Kate Ford and Laura Capps running the show here? Because that's what it sure seems like. As, as far as the other board members, Wendy Sims Moten, Virginia Alvarez, and Rose Munoz, you just sit there. And, and I think that deep down in your hearts, the three of you are troubled by this. I think you are. And you need to be brave and you need to stand up and speak what is right. Okay, Hilda, you're making a lot of money, three figures. Who is the boss? Okay, I'm asking you guys to, to, um, to seek some wisdom from God above. The Tennessee governor, Bill Lee, has declared Monday a day of prayer and fasting. He is seeking wisdom from God above. That's what you need to do. And I hope you believe in God. I don't know if you do, but if you don't, you can talk to me and I would be happy to share who God is. I will be happy to point you to scripture. Okay. Job 28, 28 says, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom and to depart from, from evil is understanding. Proverbs 19, 20, listen to advice and accept instruction. And in the end, you will be wise. Okay, we are giving you advice out here. Us people, we the people out here, we're, we're speaking to you. Listen to us. Ecclesiastes 2.26, wisdom is better than foolishness. 
just as light is better than darkness. And lastly, James 1.15, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Time. Seek God and he. Time. Thank you. Next speaker is Sonia Bareilly. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Sonia Bareilly. Yeah, I'm a husband. I'd like to express that I believe in science. But we are not able to hear you. I'm a media professional with a degree in journalism. I'm not anti vax. However, I strongly oppose the mandatory vaccination for the following reasons. The scientific data shows that almost all COVID cases for children are mild and not serious. Also, children do not transmit the disease as easily as adults. COVID cannot be compared to other serious diseases such as polio and tetanus, which may warrant a mandatory vaccine. Also, we all know that people who are vaccinated can still transmit COVID, so regular testing as an alternative would make much more sense. People who do get COVID seem to be more protected for future infections than people who are vaccinated. While it is true that children can get seriously ill and even die of COVID, these numbers should be seen in the right perspective because about 270 children aged five up to 17 died of COVID this year up to July in the USA. However, thousands of children die every year of gunshots, over a thousand die in traffic related accidents and 800 of drowning. Just to put these numbers in a context, if we really care about the safety of our children, we should shift the priority to other issues. Also, almost all the children who died of COVID had serious comorbidities. I also like to point out that many other countries, including my native country, the Netherlands, do not impose vaccines for children or school employees. And the data shows that transmission of COVID in, this, in these situations is limited. Imposing a mandatory vaccine for children seems to be more of a political statement than based on scientific data. Of course, long-term side effects for children are a big concern. All vaccines, except Hi. Pfizer. Yes. Time, thank you. The last three speakers are Lucy Oliver, Christy Lozano, and Danny Blanc. Oh, and Chadwick. I will start with Lucy Oliver. I'll go ahead and pick up where Nicole left off. I'm glad that there's a predator out of the classroom. I had a 22-year-old share with me that when she was at San Marcos, he was doing the same thing and she knew about it. So how long has this been happening? It is terrible that kids have to be the ones to turn the predators in. Where are the adults? How long have you guys known about this? How many more are there? It is common knowledge that one or more current board members went shopping for their own personal legal counsel after the VADA event and sexual predator exposures. And people, many people have talked to me about this. This is a small town, and I think it would be better time spent dealing with the problem than looking for a way to protect yourself from this. Did you guys engage in the same private investigator that Craig Price hired on your behalf to intimidate the victims and witnesses of the sexual abuse in the district? Many more predators are in this district, and they need to be dealt with. I have worked for this district over 18 years, and you have turned a blind eye to this abuse. And this is particularly egregious. There's a lot of stuff going on, but this is the, uh, as bad as it gets. Santa Barbara Unified has a horrible problem. Hilda, I am waiting for a response from you. I sent you an email over a month ago talking about the abuse that I've endured from the HR department, and you haven't responded to me. I sent you an email, I sent you videos, and you have yet to respond. Maybe you sent Steve Vence, the COO, to come and talk to me, and he emailed, and he wanted to meet up with me, and he came, and when he got there, I had brought a friend with me 
for moral support. And he refused to meet with me. And I reached out to him after to reschedule because he wanted to have his friend there too. And he has still yet to respond. So I am waiting for a response Hi. from you guys. Next speaker is Christy Lozano. Christy Lozano. Christy Lozano, can you please unmute yourself? Wait. So I, when I reached out to John Becchio, I asked if I could go over to McKinley and I could tell my kids goodbye, which is a reasonable request. 22 staff members of McKinley left there and I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to the kids. And I told you about this, Miss Maldonado, and you still have not responded to my request. So I still want to go over there. I still want to tell my kids goodbye. They deserve that. They're the most vulnerable kids in the district. And they lost a lot of people last year. I spoke with a staff member yesterday whose mom works over there. And they said, when is coach coming back? Where did coach go? You don't do that to kids. When kids have relationships with people, they should be able to say goodbye to those people when they leave. I have not asked for too much. Those kids miss me. I miss them. And it would, is reasonable for me to go over there and say goodbye to them. So I would like to be responded to for that also. Next speaker is Danny Blunk. Hi. Um, hello. Thank you for letting me speak again. Seems like the American flag is not back in the poll. And doesn't seem like you love this country, right? If you don't love this country, how can you say you love the children of this country and want to keep them safe? So I really suggest that the American flag goes back in the poll. It's been two weeks, enough time. Also, I want to uh, say again that coercion is illegal. So the, the teachers who got vaccinated that because they could lose their job, that was coercion. Because I don't think they had the choice and they probably have family to feed. And they got vaccinated to be able to keep working. So that's illegal. And also, uh, Mrs. Waganak. Uh, you showed the, the Swiss cheese chart, and they also said about the misinformation. And it seems like you don't, don't like misinformation, but you do like to instigate fear. And when people have fear, they don't think right. They are in flight and fight, so they don't think. So I really challenge you for the next meeting, bring a slide without the vaccine ingredients, that even if I want, I'm not going to be able to cite them right now, but they are poison and prove me wrong. Come and show the ingredients in the vaccines. I can say some in my last 30 seconds, formaldehyde and formalin, beta propylactone, toxic chemical and cancerigenal. There is hexadecyltrimatomonium bromide cause can, uh, damage to the liver, aluminum hydroxide, aluminum phosphate, and aluminum salts, three mesh surround, mercury, polysorbate, 20 and 20. So they are uh, not good for the kids. So don't make the kids get this. Time. Next speaker is Chadwick. Chadwick, can you please state your full name? Yes, my name is Erin Chadwick, and I'm just coming back. I'm two, it's two weeks later. I spoke to the board originally, and I, inv I invited all of you board members, Laura, Hilda, Kate, Rose, all of you guys. I invited you to come 
and meet people in our community that have been injured by this vaccine. These are injuries that have been verified by not just one doctor, but several doctors, because as you know, or maybe you don't know, when you get injured by these vaccines, they don't believe it right away. And so they verify it with doctor after doctor after doctor. So I'd like to invite you to come and meet my friend, Leah Grippo, please. You, none of you responded, not a single response. None of you are willing to come and meet people in our community that have been injured, yet you are willing to ask us to take a vaccine that could potentially hurt us. Why are you not willing to come and meet the community to help, to feed? What happens when I get hurt, when I take this vaccine? Are you going to just forget me? Are you going to see me? Why is nobody seeing these people? I know five people in our community right now respond to my email and come and meet them. Instead of sitting behind those desks, behind those masks, and ignoring those that have been injured. I don't get it. Where is your heart? In regards to the legal basis you feel you have to mandate this on our faculty, staff, and students, I'd like to remind you that the only shots available in the U.S. now are still under emergency use authorization. The Comirnaty vaccine is currently the only drug with an approved biologics license application, and coincidentally, as of right now, there are no Comirnaty doses available in the U.S. Liability for forced participation in a medical experiment, including injury or death, is incalculable. Medical and religious exemptions will be insufficient to over the illegality of these EUA mandates. You need to prove you have the authority to do this because Federal Law 21 USC, the Constitution and Bill of Rights say otherwise. EUA products are by definition experimental okay. and thus require the right. The last speaker is Denise Jaimez Villanueva. Hello, my name is Denise, thanks. My name is Denise Jaimez Villanueva, and I'm a parent that's had to deal with a couple of minor colds over the last couple of weeks. So I'm chiming in to request that the board consider a more streamlined and efficient way to test students that have potential COVID symptoms. School tests, the one at my school in particular, I'm told takes five to seven days to get the results. There are medical facilities that are only taking 24 hours to get these results. I'm personally so grateful that um, my family is able to just get by now with one income and so I can stay home to take care of my, my boys. But I really am feeling for those single parents, those working parents, um, as well as the students. You know, many of them are already behind and to have to wait five to seven days for results or longer. Um, I just think there has to be a better way. Um, I spoke to one mom whose child tested at the county. She had overheard another parent complaining that her test um, results for her child took more than seven days. And my friend um, said, you know, she couldn't consider waiting over seven days. So she ended up taking her son to a clinic and paid over $200 for hers. So again, not only is like these different amount of um, days for results ridiculous, but the difference in how much this is costing. Um, so I'm hoping that you could possibly be considering maybe a tent where it could be put at some location where there could be triage or tests given to children that are more efficient, that um, have symptoms that fall under the umbrella of COVID, but may just be a cold. Something, you know, hopefully one of these tests that takes just 24 hours rather than five to seven days and just a quicker, efficient way for parents and caregivers to be just so detrimental to lots of people. Thank you for hearing me. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Ms. Trujillo. Dr. Wagenick, I believe you have some additional information that you had hoped to share with us tonight. Yes, thank you. And I um, apologize for, uh, for leaving this off, um, but it has been included. And so, Mr. Rouse, if you would uh, bring the slide deck back up and show the, the last slide. I appreciate Ms. Sanderson bringing this to our attention. This is normally in our slide deck and uh, we had it ready and it was not in here. So I'd like to go over it at this time. Um, last, um, last week, so again, we, we post the dashboard on Friday 
and it indicates the data for the week from the Friday before through Thursday at 3 p.m. So this is through last Thursday. Uh, we had last week 17 student cases, two staff cases. That brings us to a total of 80 student cases, 23 staff cases. And again, we have um, a staff vaccination rate of nearly 92%. Um, we do not disaggregate the data at this time in terms of vaccinated or unvaccinated because to do so, especially by school, would um, risk identifying individuals and that would violate FERPA and HIPAA uh, regulations. However, what I can point to is the fact that when we look at students versus staff, we know that our staff vaccination rate is much higher than our student vaccination rate. In fact, our staff vaccination rate is 92%. We have far fewer staff cases than we do students. Now we have far fewer staff than we do students as well. But um, anecdotally, what I can tell you based on what I'm seeing, and we are collecting that data, is that the rate of the rate of cases amongst the unvaccinated is higher in our district, and I can only speak to our district, than it is amongst the vaccinated. And once we get to, sadly, I have to say, higher numbers of, um, of cases, then we move out of this risk of identifying individuals and we'll be able to disaggregate that data for you. So I hope to be able to bring to, that to you because I think it is important data to share. And I agree with those who spoke. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wagenek. Before I call on board members for questions or comments, uh, Dr. Maldonado, did you have one note you wanted to make? Yes, board members and public, while we generally do not respond to any public comments, I do want to say that we do take seriously any and all allegations against any of our employees in any way, and we would like to ask that anybody who has information about misconduct to please come forward and send me or my staff an email with such information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, board members, do you have any questions or comments regarding board report number 29 on the COVID pandemic? Ms. Munoz, do you? No questions at this time. Just thank you um, in appreciation, Dr. Wagenek, for the information that you provide and also to Dr. Maldonado. Um, thank you all. Thanks. Yes, no questions, just a fresh expression of gratitude to the students and the teachers who are working through this whole process. We'll continue to do what we need to do because we are responsible for the health and safety of our students and teachers. Thanks. Ms. Caps, do you have a comment? Yeah, I have a couple questions. So Dr. Wagner, thank you. Um, the first is on the testing. Uh, I just wanted to address, um, and just to clarify, um, uh, as board members, we can't respond to um, public comment because it's not necessarily, it's, it's part of the protocol in terms of uh, what's been agendized. But I do wanted to flag about the testing and of uh, students and, the, and I have raised concerns about the 754 that are still, um, not being tested. And so I just urge you, I know you're on it and you explain that to try to identify the barriers and they might be technological, et cetera, but that is a concern of mine that, that, that children are not being tested currently, even though we have this robust surveillance program. So just to add my um, encouragement to get that resolved as quickly as possible. And with that too, um, I wanna just ask you, what is the result time of those res of, of the test. I thought it was quicker than a speaker indicated today. Um, so I can't speak to any tests, um, obviously outside of what we do in the district. We did have a, a time period of about three or four days where the PCR, which are the, the molecular tests that were done, and those are confirmation tests. So confirmation tests after a rapid test has been done. So if we have a positive rapid test, which is what we use for surveillance, then it needs to be followed up with a PCR molecular test 
um, there was a time period a week and a half or so ago when the lab itself had issues with staffing and returning tests. As a result, we were not getting um, that back from the lab. That is not a common occurrence. And what we find in the vast majority of cases is that we get that those results back in 24 to 36 hours. Excellent. So when that's my experience too, uh, with my son's testing, he's been tested now twice, um, through the school. And it was actually the same day that we got the results, but I just, uh, so it sounds like there might've been a glitch, but in general, it's 24 to 36 hours. I also wanted to raise the question of when a child is sick, because we now know so much more about the symptoms of COVID with children, that it can be just a simple, runny nose or a cough or just a, a slight stomach ache that it doesn't present um, it, the way that at the beginning of this pandemic, um, adults were coming down with COVID. And so what happens um, when a student, uh, a, a parent on crisis go says, my child is staying home because of symptoms? Is there follow-up with, with getting tests? Can you speak to that and sort of what, I think that might've been what this, one of the speakers was asking about uh, her child has a cold. What is the protocol? If you could just revert, re, uh, remind me of that and also talk about testing in that situation. No, those are, I really appreciate the opportunity to address that. So let's go with symptoms first. If um, my child is, it needs to stay home because they have symptoms. And I'm going to notify through Crisis Go that they're they are staying home because of symptoms. Um, they may return when one of three things occurs: either um, they are home for a certain number of days, and then they have a molecular PCR test that says that they are um, do not have COVID. Uh, the second thing is that they go to a physician um, or, you know, a, a clinic and receive documentation that their symptoms are a result of another condition, mm -hmm. asthma, allergies, et cetera, et cetera, strep throat, whatever it is, and that they may return. Um, so it's an ongoing condition or that... Um, another diagnosis has been made um, on the, and, and I know those last two are kind of similar, but one, one has to do with like ongoing medical conditions such as asthma. Another is, I misspoke, the strep throat or some other right. uh, condition that they have. And so um, it's either quarantining and then after a certain number of days, um, which changes from time to time, but the school nurse can give them that number of days, then if they have a negative test, they can return to school. So if one of those three things happens, then they return to school. Now in terms, did you have a comment, Dr. Maldonado? Uh, I do wanna just also remind us that we do have a video we sent to families mm -hmm. this weekend that's posted on our website that also goes through the step-by-step decision-making tree and the steps that, Great. that will be taken and that lives live on our website and it was also sent to parents through Parent right. Square. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wagner. You can keep going, but I just want to make sure people okay. know this is also available for anyone to view. Great. Right. And that is on our website, far left side, orange, COVID-19 resources. Go there. Uh, a lot of good information. So let's go then to what happens uh, at the school if we get a notification of symptoms. Um, uh, one or two individuals from each school are responsible for calling all of the families who indicated that their student was out because of symptoms. They don't call every day, mm -hmm. but that first time, um, let's say it's over a period of a week, they'll call that first time and walk them through a number of questions. Um, and then if the nurse needs to contact them, they'll notify the nurse. So they go through a protocol of checking in with the families, reminding them of the steps they need to take and then making contact um, making contact with the uh, school health tech or nurse et cetera. and then can they are they offered a school test at that point I mean could they come into school and have one of the free tests at, at school we have been doing that for quite a while yeah that's and right. and offering that 
we are in the process of changing that and looking to set up two um, sites within the district where people can go because it really is dangerous to have symptomatic individuals come into the school. And, um, and so we're, we're trying to make some additions, but we are offering tests to families and that's the important. Thank you. I, pro I, uh, I definitely support maintaining that offering. And if you need to consolidate it, that makes sense to me, but I, I think that's important because I have heard, you know, with some testing, it's not as available as it sometimes was or a little confusing or um, the, the results might take longer. So, okay, quickly moving on. Um, I do want to say that I um, was on a, a parent, I was talking to some parents and there was a question about um, eventually, um, you know, clinics being at um, elementary schools as well. And the conversation came up about some teachers wanting, now that teachers are reaching the point of where they are eligible for a booster, should they choose to have it uh, because they've, uh, you know, got their second shot to uh, six months ago and they're eligible uh, per the, um, per the uh, CDC. Um, what are we, are we, are our clinics communicating about boosters? I, you mentioned second shot, but obviously I know that the doses are all the same. So are you, is that, can that be part of the language given that teachers and staff are now reaching that point in which they're, um, according to the, the results, their immunity might be waning. It certainly could be there. I mean, really anyone can go in sure. and, uh, for instance, I was at Santa Barbara junior high last week for their clinic. And within 10, the first 10 minutes I walked in and it was, the room was full. And so that was good to see the community taking advantage. There's no reason we can't do that. And I know, uh, Ms. Barnwell and around here somewhere and she can work with Pottage on the marketing of that. So no reason they shouldn't be, um, so. Okay, great. And I just wanted to end with this uh, acknowledgement of the confusion. I believe, I believe uh, the governor's uh, announcement about student vaccines that COVID-19 would be added to the many lists, uh, the, to the, list, the long list of vaccinations that are required to attend school, both private and public in California. And whether that's January or June continues to confound me. The more that, uh, the more that I look it up, it looks as though it's probably July. I, I misspoke, not, not June, but July, 2022. But any clarity that we can get, because again, if it's January for those 16 above currently, um, that's a very important mm -hmm. piece of information for families to understand at this point. And um, if anything we can do to get clarity from the governor's office through, through county public health would be welcome. Uh, because again, I, if you Google and look at different articles from what the governor did, uh, it doesn't appear to be specific about whether or not it says, it says January or, Ju or July. So again, if it's January in particular, um, given our vaccination rate that we know of, of students, which is 22%, that's what we know of, um, that is an important piece of information for parents and families and students to be making decision-wise. And I know that Dr. Maldonado attends uh, the briefing with the county superintendents every week, and that's where they get the newest information. So we'll stay on that. And I just want to acknowledge with that, with the, the decision that families are facing every day about vaccinating their children, that, you know, I, I continue to read as much as I can about myocarditis. Um, that seems to be the, you know, the concerning uh, side effect, especially amongst boys and men, 12 to 22, et cetera. So um, I am monitoring that very closely and appreciate any information about that. I think that goes into the decision that many families are making. And it is, it is a different one uh, because of that concern um, than it is for adults uh, in, my, in my estimation. So I just wanted to acknowledge that concern that is, uh, is out there and, and something I can empathize with. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wagenick for that excellent presentation. I have a, a couple of comments and then a couple of questions. Uh, being that we're an academic institution, we based our decisions on data. So I want to make double check my numbers with your numbers that you showed on the slide. Uh, we have 12,701 students 
And out of those 12,701, about 80 students have tested positive since the beginning of the school year. Mm -hmm. So that's about a 0.6%. And when you showed the Swiss cheese model, mm -hmm. so what that's telling us is that our practices that we have in place are working. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we find additional information, if we need to make changes, those changes will be made. But as of now, it seems to me based on this data that what we're doing is we're following the science, we're following the most updates. And as a result, less than 1% of our students have tested positive. And uh, when I looked at the staff data, it, we have about 1,679 employees 23 staff members have tested positive. That's about a 1.3%. Mm -hmm. So again, that tells us, is it perfect? No, it's never going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. We're learning every single day. But if we keep doing the practices that we are doing, the mitigation that we have in place, the data shows that we will be able to keep schools open if we keep doing what we can do, which is what we all want. Are you, do you agree with those numbers? Did I miss anything? No, and I, I appreciate you actually um, crunching the numbers uh, because we didn't have the percentages there, but oh, that's what we've been seeing. And our goal was never to, you know, we knew we couldn't keep COVID entirely out of our schools, but to keep school open. And, and someone asked me that the other day, uh, a friend, we were talking and they said, you know, do you think you're going to have to close schools this year? And I said, I really do not. I believe that we have everything in place that we need to keep schools open. Is it difficult? Absolutely, it's difficult. These are the hardest years that, that our teachers and administrators ever faced. I mean, or ever imagined that they would face. And, and but will we keep the schools open? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll do everything we can, absolutely. And um, then I have one question about the staff. So I don't know if this is for you or for Dr. Becchio. On the slide, you said there's 20 uh, staff members that we're waiting responses from. W what are we doing to encourage them to get responses? I, I thank you to all of those that have responded that are either working with Dr. Becchio and his staff for the interactive process or have uploaded your vaccine card, we're about at 94%. My question is those 20, how are we helping them to give us a response? Right, so um, I actually took a look at the current spreadsheet data. We have zero non-response from regular employees. Regular employees, remember there are 11 or so employees who are on leave of absence. Those are non-responses as well. Um, we also have 23 walk-on coaches out of 100, and I think it was 168 that were our non-responses in our system. So I wanted to report that current data. I just looked at the spreadsheet and crunched the numbers for you. Great, thank you. That that helps a lot. And then lastly, I want to say thank you. I acknowledge the hard work at the school sites. Uh, besides the regular work, this is on top of what they have to do every day. I want to acknowledge the principals, the admin team, the teachers, the office assistants, the nurses, everyone who is involved in helping with this tracking, helping with the testing. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's an effort. It's teamwork. And we're, we're all in this together for the teachers and the students. So thank you very much. I agree. Thank you. Thanks. And Mr. Kelly, please. Uh, no questions or comments. Just I'd like to express my gratitude. Thank you so much for all the work you do. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thanks, I just have one question, Dr. Wagenick, and also want to share my gratitude to you. Um, I, I am looking as we all are for the most accurate data and I'm wondering how easy is it for the teenagers to register their vaccination status? And if it is not as easy as we might hope it is so that we get accurate numbers, is, are, uh, are there ways to make it simpler? Thank you. I'm actually going to ask Mr. Rouse to come up and give you a very succinct description of what the process is. Good evening. Hi. So in order to uh, provide their vaccination cards, 
uh, students or their family members can log into ARIES, basically the same way that they log into ARIES during the annual registration process and upload their proof of address. So it's a, basically you go and you click on, up, on uh, uploading a, you go to this uh, portal document request screen, you click upload, you upload your card and you hit submit and you're done. And then school staff review that document, verify that all the information matches and you're considered uh, to have uh, completed the process. Thank you. And we do have uh, articles we shared with all families in English and Spanish with screenshots of the process. Thank you very much. Uh, before we close this item, Dr. Wagenick, do you have anything else you'd like to say or add? No, I think that for tonight I have said it all and I'll be back in two weeks with board report number 30. Number 30, we look forward to it. I, I just want to close by adding that in addition to all the gratitude to our staff members and to parents and students for their involvement in trying to mitigate all of the uh, horrors of this pandemic, I also want to thank Dr. Maldonado and the board members. I think that you, um, it's an honor to serve with you. You care deeply about the children of this district. You do extensive research all the time. You read all the emails that we receive and you reflect on them very carefully and you act on what you learn and you stay open and diligent. So thank you to all of you. Now, switching gears, board members, we're going on to the public hearing about the board trustee areas and the maps. So take a few seconds to get ready and then I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Maldonado. Just, just to introduce the topic, I'll just mention that this is the first real public hearing on trustee area scenarios. Scott Newell, the CEO of Cooperative Strategies is going to present the three maps that divide the district into five trustee areas. And then we'll receive public input on the maps, followed by input from board members about the public hearings. Also at a later date, we will see a we'll see recommendations for a seven member board, but that is not tonight. So first of all, uh, Dr. Maldonado, please. Thank you, Board President Ford. You pretty much uh, stated some of the in points I was going to make. And uh, thank you to Scott for being here. We will be bringing that information. I, do, I did want him to start off by uh, sharing with us the process that they engage in uh, before they created the maps that are before us and on our website today. Uh, I do want the public to know that all of these are posted on, website, on our website as well with a special page uh, dedicated to this topic. Scott, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm Scott Newell with Cooperative Strategies, and we are the demographer for looking at some new scenarios for a by trustee voting area system at the school district. Um, go ahead and, and flip the slide here. And as mentioned, the website right now for folks that want to take a look at the maps at the conclusion of this at greater detail, um, even provide some, some input, it's all on the website. And we will be having some community meetings that you'll have an additional chance to review these and provide your input as well. And I'm gonna go ahead on my other screen here so I can see it. Working through uh, the process so far. And so to date, um, and this started back in August, We've had two board meetings where essentially um, we just talked about the process, talked about why we're, we're moving from an at-large to a by trustee area, um, and talked about the, the legality around um, uh, what's involved, and also just things to consider um, as you move forward with drawing uh, voting area lines. And so we've had those two meetings, as you see, in August and September. And then we were waiting until the new census data for 2020 was released, which was released not too long ago, so that we could use that data to draw our initial maps. You can see on the schedule now for October, we're having our preliminary first meeting to review our first draft maps. And I say that, um, so you hear that this is the first go around at this. We've taken a stab uh, based on, you'll see on the next slide with some considerations. And the point of tonight is to really uh, then lay them out and get some feedback from you on how we can refine those maps, how we can 
um, hear things that, that we don't know, not living in the community. Uh, we follow what um, we're supposed to based on the legal requirements. And so really this is an opportunity to look at those. We'll explain how they kind of work um, and then get some ideas on how we can make them better. So you can see the next two meetings are community meetings to really talk again in, in greater detail about these maps, uh, listen to considerations, and then go to work to draw some next scenarios. And so we will bring those to the board on October 26th. So that'll be a refined uh, version of the maps, maybe some new maps, maybe just some modified maps from what we're showing tonight. And then we'll go through the same process again of, of listening and refining till we get to a point where you can see on November 16th, we would have a final map hearing and um, the board might consider uh, changing that election method. So after that, um, once, once a, a map uh, has been selected, adopted, they'll go to the County Committee on School District Organization and they will hold a public meeting to uh, decide whether or not to approve the election method and, and the trust area maps. And these will take effect um, for next year's election. So if you wanna move on uh, with the slide, I'm sorry, there you go. So these are the uh, considerations and these are things that we consider. And they're also things that we would want you as the community and the board to think about as well. Uh, the easiest way to look at these, the first two, uh, each area shall contain nearly equal number of inhabitants and drawn to comply with federal voting rights are must do's, okay? So those are things when we're drawing these maps that we must do. We must try to make each trustee area uh, nearly equal to the population. And then the second one there, we must try to uh, draw them so they comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, which basically identifies protected classes. And in this case, it's not protected classes in the traditional sense. Really, it's looking at the demographic composition of the um, racial and the language minority groups that make up the district so that they have um, great representation in each area. So beyond that, uh, there's other things that you as a district uh, will want to look at. And so we, we've tried to put some scenarios together that also contemplate these other things. Compact and contiguous as much as possible. So, um, you know, if you can get nice, neat areas put together, that's great. Um, possibly respect communities of interest as much as possible. And so if there are, you know, we have some cities within the school district, we have some areas that are considered communities. Um, so if you wanna contemplate how those might be represented in a, in a line, that's something to look at. Other things, uh, whether it's a, a man-made feature such as a major interstate, um, you know, roads that have a, a egress pass that everybody is aware of, or geographic features like a mountain range that separates two parts of the school district, et cetera. Um, possibly looking at those scenarios. Uh, respect incumbency if possible. That's in there. It's not something that is a key driver. I would say in simple forms, if there is a line and um, an incumbent that it fits all of the parameters nicely, that it might make sense to continue, but it's really not a key driver in these, but nevertheless, it needs to be said. And then other local considerations, if you want to contemplate school district boundaries, um, other locations of sites, things that might make sense when drawing a map, those are all things to look at. And so we have three scenarios tonight for you to, to contemplate. Um, I'll kind of go through those. So uh, the first set, you I'll go into a little more detail, just narrating around the maps themselves and the numbers so that you get a good sense of what you're looking at. Um, and I will say we have blown up our, our maps to kind of focus on the areas where you can see on this presentation. But again, if you go on the website, you can see the full scale school district maps um, and then the blown up uh, maps as well. So this is all on the website. Next slide, please. And we'll go one more. Okay. So just to kind of get a, a point of navigation here, if you look at the big black line, that's obviously the uh, total Santa Barbara Unified boundary. Um, the blue lines are the elementary feeder districts. The gray outside is not part of the school district. And then you can see, and I know it's very hard to see on here, uh, we've got little school sites. So the blue uh, little carrots up there are the elementary sites, the green are the junior high sites, red are high schools, and the purple are alternative sites, okay? 
Um, for each map, we've used the same colors for the voting areas, so you can kind of uh, visualize how those are shifting and knowing that that's the same area we're talking about. So in this case, trustee area number one is in yellow, and that's really looking at the east side of the district. Uh, what you don't see on here, uh, Montecito Union, um, Cold Springs, those are, are basically you can look at this blow up and think that everything going east is encapsulated in trustee area number one. Okay, so number two, you've got the south side there. Uh, number three is in the, we'll call it the salmon color, the reddish color. And as you can see, that's encapsulating hope in this scenario, uh, portion of Galita, the northeast portion. And then number four is in the blue. And so number four goes all the way west uh, to the west side of Galita. And then uh, as you can see, apportionment north and south. And then the purple or lavender color is number five, which you can see encompasses the south side of Pulita there. So, you know, in this scenario, really, um, we were looking at it more from a kind of east to west, if you will, uh, lens. And if you want to go to the next slide here, we can talk about how these numbers uh, shake out. So, you know, there's a few key things on here. This is a very busy slide with a lot of facts. Um, you know, one of the first considerations I, I mentioned to you guys is that each section should contain nearly uh, the equal number of inhabitants. So right now we've done a run with five trustee areas. So if you take the total population up here and you simply divide that by five, you get 38,119 inhabitants per area in a perfect scenario, okay? Then we've got variance. So variance in its simplest form, and we'll just take this top population variance here, it's taking your lowest, so in this case, uh, minus 0.4%, and your highest, and giving you your range of 2.4. I will say all the scenarios that we have uh, provided tonight fall within an acceptable range. So all of these um, allow you to uh, adopt if you so wanted, and they would be acceptable. Uh, for everybody's knowledge, you know, if you get above 10%, that's when you get into an area of trouble. And so all of these fall with, uh, in that variance. And, and really, when we look at the composition of the district, um, your variance is, is very tight and it's very good. Um, you know, a lot we see sometimes hedge up there to 5 to 7%. So those are important numbers up there. If we just kind of scroll the top part here, you can see that the total population, when you break these down by trustee area, they're all really close to that 38,001 mark, okay? And the difference between the two, we've got total population here, and then we've got the citizen voting age population in the darker gray. So that's essentially folks over uh, 18. So then looking at requirement two to comply with federal law and the California uh, Voter Act, we look at your biggest, um, your biggest minority group here, which is your Hispanic and Latino. So if we kind of focus on the column that is the third column down, if you look at this scenario here, you've got trustee voting area number one uh, with 40% representation um, showing up there. And if you look at the spread across, you've got a pretty good representation in this scenario. Okay, so let's move on to number two. All right, so now if you kind of look at the differences here, you can see some shifts. So, uh, you know, some key differences here with number two, we kind of tried to do a, a north-south split instead of an east-west. And if you look at the, the bigger expanded map, you will see that a little bit better. Um, you can see we tried to do some markation here around uh, road 154, um, breaking down Foothill Road a little bit as part of that point, we moved, um, trustee number two to the east a little bit. Um, in all these scenarios, you can see that at least uh, we're trying to get a good blend uh, in Santa Barbara Unified, having uh, multiple representation there, and then over in Goleta, multiple representation there. If you want to scroll to the next slide. So when we look at the figures with this run, you can see that our variance is up uh, about a percent and a half. And uh, when you look at the Hispanic and Latino population here, you have a greater representation in trustee area number two this time. 
beyond that, everything else is, is relatively similar with the um, population spread across the board. Okay, we wanna to go to number three. So number three here, um, you know, I would say the biggest change with this, you can see there's a lot of similarities um, in, in some of the areas, but uh, what we tried to do is make this one about as compact and contiguous um, as possible. So again, on the expanded map, you would see that each of these kind of blobs, if you will, um, they're all about the same size. Um, they don't really uh, look so much at certain points of um, you know, man-made items or, or otherwise uh, other things. So go ahead and go to the numbers on this one. You can see the variance level is about the same as our second run. Um, and the spread for your Hispanic and Latino population. Again, uh, trusty area number two still has the highest percentage there. Um, and there's a slight shift with number three. So go ahead and go to our next slide here. So really, uh, you know, at this point, when we're looking for feedback, we're really looking for those comments that say, um, you know, what would you consider, what would you like us to consider that you believe might represent you as a community, you as a board um, in a very impactful way beyond what we've shown. Um, you may be happy with the, the ones that you see right now. You may say, you know, I'm really, really liking scenario one, scenario two uh, better, uh, but maybe we want to refine this or can we possibly shift uh, one of the marks east or west or, or anything of that nature. Uh, like I said, uh, if you were to ask why, why we, uh, what we'd look at and uh, when we run these, it really is those first two requirements, first and foremost, and then try to give you a couple options that might meet, at least in our opinion, some of the other uh, considerations out there. But again, as um, demographers, we really wanna make something that uh, is meaningful to you. And so, you know, at this point, I'd entertain any, any comments, questions you might have. And then again, for those that, that couldn't attend tonight that have friends, we're hosting a series of community meetings to uh, dive deeper as well. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, at this time, members of the public, it is your chance for comment on this report and on the three maps. So a reminder to please use your Zoom icon to raise your hands. Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? Thank you, President For We have one public comment on this item. RS, RS, if you can please state your full name. RS, are you there? Can you hear us? Please unmute yourself. Hello, can we hear, can you hear us? One moment. RS, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, we're not able to connect with RS. Um, we, we can go back in a little bit if you wish, President Ford. Thank you so much. We will uh, is keep me posted on the progress on making contact with RS. In the meantime, board members, do you have any further comments or questions? Ms. Munoz. Well, certainly. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and the information about the different maps. I was also, you know, would like to comment about the uh, percentage of Latinos in that's noted and I thank you for that. I would also like to point out in terms of the um, black and African-American um, percentages in the different maps, 
um, the two or more races and also the, the Asian um, population and, and voters in, in those maps. <clears throat> in terms of you know, equity and, and good, good distribution and representation. Was that a request or a question? Sorry. No, more of a um, comment. State comment in terms of the importance of, of highlighting them. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just um, well, again thank you fun. for thank you for the presentation of the maps tonight. I must admit I don't fully understand where we're going with this, but I'm sure I'll be more informed as we as we get there to truly understand what this means. It's really important for for me to ensure that whatever map we choose, that it benefits each and every one of our students. Um, with regards to that, I think it's really important to make sure as we're starting to look at this, that this doesn't say that we're gonna pick and choose our students based on a district. It really has to be really clearly stated that even though we're going into district trustees areas based on the fact that we need to do you know, more representation, and I agree with that, but I, I'm really concerned that, um, that this not turn into an each and student based on the district where you live, but more about that you're part of Santa Barbara Unified and all students, each and every student is still valued no matter where you live and no, ma no matter where you're drawing the trustee area. So I think that's really important um, for me as I look at this and in my um, small understanding of what the overall picture is. So could you explain what CVAP is? Can you, can you hear me still? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great, sorry about that. So uh, CVAP is the citizen voting age population. So in a nutshell, you, you might have, let's say a hundred people that reside in a certain area, but uh, you know, 70 of them are over age 18. And so they're the, the population that would be allowed to vote for, for this. So that's kind of the, the difference between the two categories there. Okay, thank you. And I, I too agree with in terms of the, how um, the distribution of our, our students are in terms of population by ethnicity. I see that it's not really varying too much uh, from the in between the three three maps. So I really can appreciate and can see see that part um, as well. And have you so what groups um, provided input for this uh, stage at this point? So at, at this stage, um, nobody's provided input yet. So this is okay. draft one. And so they are now on the website. There is a link there for folks that maybe can't attend the community meetings coming forward or didn't um, present a comment tonight that they can submit a comment on the website uh, for us to consider. The two community meetings we have coming up is an opportunity for, for folks to ask questions maybe about the process or about um, where certain lines are and how they might impact if they're changed. And then based on that feedback, uh, we will revise these maps, uh, maybe provide some new maps for you to consider at uh, the next meeting. And so from there, we can talk about, um, you know, what we heard and, and why certain changes were made, et cetera. Um, and then we'll go through that kind of process again um, to hopefully arrive at something that is aligned with, with what the community um, is looking to, to have done. Okay, thank you. And one last question would be, what's your outreach process to get the most diverse input? So, because not everybody goes to our website. So how are we reaching out to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to participate in this process? Do you want do you want me to take that or or would you guys at the district like to take that one? Members. Initially the plan was to hold these in-person meetings at different school sites throughout the district, but because of the rates and what is happening with Delta, we have had to do it via, uh, via a webinar style. The contract calls for us to work with cooperative strategies. They will be setting up the links for the webinar and everything else. Uh, but if there is um, other ideas of beyond the webinars at this time that you would like us to explore, we can also do that. But at this time, it's only been done uh, in a webinar style. 
Okay, so we could then share with you if there are other groups that don't necessarily uh, participate in this process so that they are able to participate, share with you. Absolutely, with you. Okay. let me know and I will work with Scott and his team to try to set up additional opportunities that okay. you see appropriate. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Caps. Yeah, thank you. I, I just, uh, I do wanna ask about the five and seven and I, uh, President Ford, could you repeat what you said at the beginning of this to introduce it? Um, about when we will talk about the seven. I do believe that when this whole process was kicked off uh, in good faith, we told uh, tr stakeholders that, that we would be exploring seven as in addition to five. And, you know, you just look at the population, 190,000 people uh, for five uh, areas compared to our, our city council, which has five uh, districts yet, 90 some thousand people. So um, I just want to understand when the seven, uh, when it's, when it will be uh, considered the seven seats. Well, I think it's a great question. And um, this is one for Scott. It's also a request. Uh, we did promise the community that we would look at a seven member board and seven air trustee areas. And so could we expect that at least one scenario will come to us on October 26th? Yes. Yes, that's Great. not a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. I appreciate that. And um, I appreciate the stakeholders who reached out about that today. Um, this is kind of an esoteric question, but just looking at this map, um, does it, or these three maps, do they have to be geographic like this? So Contiguous. Yeah, contiguous. I, I just, I'm trying to under get my head around the fact that you know, one district might have five, six, seven schools and another district would have two schools. Um, and I understand obviously with, with other um, bodies of government, it makes sense to have contigu contiguous districts, but are we bound by that? Because I do see that as um, a deficit. So, um, and you know, Austin could better answer this, but I do believe we are bound by that. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can create little fingers or little sections that uh, might further represent or bring in a population that would allow them to be balanced better or represent a, a certain um, demographic better. Um, you know, those are the primary intents of the voting areas. Um, is to keep those two metrics intact. Um, but I can definitely get back to you if you would like a definitive answer on, on the contiguous. Um, to my knowledge, that's, that is a, a requirement. Yeah, I'd like, I would like that confirmed because again, I just, I see that, I understand that, you know, communities don't all live in the same neighborhoods, right? So you could argue that, um, that districts could be sliced a bit uh, I know that makes things much more complicated, but again, I just think this, the imbalance of, of what we're looking at, um, I, it's, it, it makes me ponder what that kind of representation would look like going forward. If, again, if one board member really represents, I understand uh, to Ms. Simmons-Moton's point, once you're on the board, you represent all of the schools, but you're really just, um, you know, representing the people affiliated with one or two schools versus your colleague who's representing the people affiliated with five, I believe five or six schools in other districts. So I just want to raise that concern. Thank you. Well, thank you. Ms. Alvarez. My question was uh, along the same <laughs> lines as um, Ms. Capps. Um, looking at trustee area, I think it's five, and, and the school there is Dos Pueblos. There's no elementary at all. So my wondering is the same, if they could be, the districts could be divided so a little bit different so that the trustees have both elementary and secondary schools. We can contemplate it. It's, um, you know, creating a, scenario that would um, allow that to occur, but also allow the population balancing uh, and the demographic balancing it, you know, th the way this um, 
is laid out, it can be very tricky, but it's certainly something we can try to contemplate with a uh, scenario. Thanks. Mr. Kelly. Uh, no, no questions or comments at this moment. You all had such great questions, so. Thanks a lot. Uh, just a couple questions. Um, thank you for, con well, first of all, thank you for confirming that you can bring to us a seven trustee area map in uh, at our next meeting on October 26th. Also, I was wondering if you could describe for us what a community meeting is like. So um, not that dissimilar to, to this right now, we would go through the process uh, talk about the, the why uh, behind moving from an at-large district to a, a by-area district. Um, talk about the considerations, again, that we, we have highlighted, and then really uh, work through each scenario and, and allow uh, individuals to ask these similar questions um, and talk through you know, uh, assumptions, really, and then at the closure of that, take those down and potentially modify or provide new scenarios for, um, you know, the next hearing. Okay. Thank you. I also uh, share the concerns about the way lines are drawn. And I know there are so many different factors that must be considered, and I appreciate you trying to meet all of them. I think that uh, though it could be pretty realistically said that the concerns of the east side may not be quite the same concerns as the Montecito part of town. And so I really appreciate your looking at every aspect of how the population rolls out in this town. I'd also like to ask Dr. Maldonado to give us some specific information about the use of the website in finding this information. Thank you. And I'm gonna ask my team to please bring up the website. If you go to our main webpage, actually go back to the main webpage, please. When you go to our main webpage at the top, you'll see uh, links, you look at board. Once you get to the board uh, icon, to the right are the trustee areas, so you click on that. And then if you scroll up, you'll notice that all the information is there, including the maps. They can be downloaded into a PDF file. And on the left-hand side is a little page. Oh, sorry, keep going. Yes, keep going. The timeline is there along with FAQs. Uh, any frequently asked questions? Uh, what is CVRA, for example, and others are there. So all that information is on this link on this page. And if you go back up, you'll notice to the left of the maps is a small notebook-like picture. That is a survey. If you can click on that, please. That also folks who cannot attend our webinars uh, use to give us feedback on the maps. So again, people can either come to our community events, or they can use the survey link to provide feedback on the maps. So board members, that is where this information lives. Again, it's under the tab called board and then trustee areas. Dr. Maldonado, because of the importance of this, is there a chance that on the first page you wouldn't have, you could do some sort of a click link so that you don't have to go to the board in particular? It might not be totally easy for people to understand it's that it's a board issue. Yes, it's I will a district work with uh, Ms. Barnwell to do that. And we will move a link to the beginning, to the front page. Um, we will take one of these icons off and add the trustee election there. I love that, thank you. And Ms. sims -Moten, would you like to ask one more question? Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to make sure now that the community meetings are upcoming, will you be sharing our board comments with that group of folks and vice versa? Will you be sharing with us what the community comments were? Yeah, I think part of facilitation um, is certainly so everybody knows uh, from a transparency and assumptions as to why you know we might modify something. It makes a lot of sense. And sometimes um, it helps stir conversation too to say here's some things that have been already contemplated. And so, you know, I have our notes from tonight and then the same thing when we come back for our next uh, board meeting, um, we'll talk about why we changed the things we changed and maybe, you know, some of the larger comments that we heard. Um, same with the survey results, things like that, that are guiding 
uh, these decisions to refine these these maps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, for your presentation and for working to, uh, and Dr. Maldonado for working to make the, the uh, website as user-friendly as possible. And with that, I will close this first public hearing on the trustee areas. Board members, we will take a 10 minute sorry, break. President Ford, I'm sorry to interrupt. We do have one speaker on this item. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, great, please. We have Susan Horn. Hi, this is Susan Horn talking. I just was wondering about if the maps could put up the schools on each place where they are on the, you know, so you can see where are those schools? Because it seems like that's such a huge thing of, of uh, how many schools are in each district, that kind of thing, to make it more, more evenly divided among the trustees. Thank you. Just to confirm, I think they are, but I'd like to request of Scott that uh, there's some better designation or bigger icon or something. I think they're hard to see. I, I can definitely make the icons bigger. You, you are correct. Um, they are denoted on there right now. They are small, especially when you're looking on a, on a screen right now. So we can definitely make them bigger. Thank you very much. And thanks for that comment. Mr. Trujillo, are there any other public comments? No, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you. And so we will go forth with our break and board members, we will come back at 8 p.m. 10 minutes from now. Thank you. Resume our board meeting, please, and head back to item number seven, and that is board comments and correspondence. And um, uh, as a reminder, just to let you know that as you can see on the agenda, after the board members have all reported, then we will hear from Mr. Kelly, our student representative. So first of all, board members, Ms. Munoz. Thank you, President Ford. Um, I just wanted to, you know, again, as we've, I know we've said earlier, but just commend the teachers and the staff at the, diff at the schools and our parents and our community in the effort as we um, deal with COVID and get through this time, looking forward to having us just do well as a community. So thank you to all. Um, I also wanted to mention that I attended um, Housing Santa Barbara Day this past weekend, um, a great event that was put on. There was about 30 um, different agencies there. And my take on it is food, shelter, and stability. Um, for our families and the community also. Um, <clears throat> I spoke to a, a dad who had his son with him and they were li they're living out of their car and the son is a student. You know, I didn't ask what school and so forth, but just it was, um, it was great to see the community uh, agency that was talking with him in terms of coming to a solution to help them as a small family. Um, the food bank was there, the Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinic was there giving the COVID vaccine uh, flu shot and booster shots. They had the safe parking program there and workshops on home ownership and uh, ADUs and such. Um, family service, Mexican consulate was there. And just an example of how Santa Barbara comes together to serve, to serve our community. Wonderful, thank you. Ms. sims Moten. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to the, the Youth Makers Market. I am styling the ring here that was in the little packet. Happens to match the orange that I'm wearing today. And I've also placed some orders. So just so I want to let you know, supporting you that. And then um, I would just like to say I attended on September 29th the, um, the Love of Literacy event that was sponsored by the Santa Barbara Education Foundation at the Elians Park. It was such a beautiful day. And there was even a Goodyear blimp that was ordered for the moment. So it was good to be able to see that. It was a, it was a great setting. Um, I hadn't really been to that part of the park, you know, in terms of that. So I didn't even realize that part was there. So it was, it was just fitting for the day. And our own Dr. Maladaldo was a keynote speaker that talked about the importance of literacy and, um, you know, how we're, the program that we're, they were raising funds for that. And 
and I just want to appreciate just the hard work that they do to raise funds for this district. It is just outstanding. And the things that we couldn't do, we're able to do because they raised the money and really committed to this district. So I want to always say thank you and in, in my appreciation um, to them. And I really had a good time. I think they raised a lot of money <laughs> about the level of literacy and, and, you know, because they care about our students. And we were able to hear also from some community members about uh, why they support the Santa Barbara Education Foundation. And I just want to say I was pleased to be a part of part of that very successful event and hope you all get to attend next year. Not necessary for literacy, but another uh, luncheon anyway. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Caps. Just briefly, I'd like to reiterate my gratitude for the many, many people who take the time to write to us uh, by email and speak at our board meetings. It's democracy and we we listen, we, list, uh, we read every email. I read every email, I should say. I, mean, I know my colleagues do as well and just wanna say thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Alvarez, please. Yes, uh, I too attended the Love of Literacy luncheon and thank you to all the donors, all the supporters. I believe that about $60,000 was raised at that event, if, if I remember correctly. So thank you to all the supporters. Also, once again, uh, thank you to the teachers for all the hard work that you do. Thank you for the letters that you've been sending. I wanna assure you that um, I read all of them and thank you for all your hard work. And also thank you to our guest today. And I, I'm also sporting my ring and I wanna let my honey know out there that I do have a new ring and I have honey. So honey, step it up. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, that's great. Um, I'll just add that I also attended, the entire board attended the Love of Literacy Luncheon and, and each each speaker was powerful in their passion for reading and writing. It was a truly beautiful afternoon. I, I also thank the Santa Barbara Ed Foundation and congratulations to Dr. Maldonado for representing the district so beautifully. Also, I'm happy to report that as a representative of our school board to the Santa Barbara County School Board Executive Committee, I was part of a group that was invited to visit the new Santa Marita High School District Career Tech Center. And I'm telling you, it was amazing. Everyone should have a chance and they're very open to having visitors to see this facility. We were able to watch students uh, in the carpentry area, the metal workshop area, using the highest levels of technology and tools to plan and to build the culinary center there is state of the art and the farm and agricultural sciences areas were also stunning. It was truly truly inspiring and gave me lots of ideas of what we might someday do here in Santa Barbara too. And finally, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I think some of you know I'm a member of the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum's uh, Education Committee. And I wanted to give everyone a heads up about uh, the next major exhibit at the museum is called Whales and Climate Change. And part of the exhibit will be children's artwork depicting the beauty of whales. I really hope that many district students participate. I'll give you more information later. Also, I'm so excited to announce that Santa Barbara is applying to become an official whale heritage site, which is a worldwide program to identify destinations around the world that implement and celebrate responsible and sustainable whale and dolphin watching. So with this coveted designation, um, heritage sites become places where it is known that people respect, celebrate, and protect cetaceans and their habitats looking far into the future. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. So um, first off, we had homecoming and it was great. Um, it was great to finally have a dance after two years, and it was the biggest turnout of a dance that we know of in, in my high school's history. So shout out to everyone uh, at my school that helped plan that. I also like to express my gratitude towards the teachers and admin. Uh, I see how hard you guys are working on a daily basis to get school going, especially in a pandemic environment. So uh, your work is has not gone unnoticed. Uh, I'm continuing to work on student communication. A lot of the problems we have within our district are just a matter of communicating with students and misinformation or lack of information. So I think it's important that we express what we are doing and why we are doing it on all levels. 
Uh, another thing on Sunday, we was World Mental Health Day, and I think this is especially important now. Uh, stress is at an all-time high that I see uh, in schools. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're nearing the end. Uh, we've had a lot of events on my campus that have heightened stress. We're towards the end of finals. Even today, it was the air quality was so bad at school that a few um, practices were canceled. So it seems like a lot is heightening and that's why it is important to remember to um, just acknowledge your own mental health and the mental health in your peers. Uh, if we all look out for each other, then we will not have to um, let anyone suffer in silence. So I would like to say some statistics just to remind us how important it is uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death among young, um, among youth ages 10 to 24, and 20% of all youth ages 13 to 18 live with a mental health condition. Uh, this is why it is imperative that we have mandatory mental health education in our schools. Uh, every single student goes to school, and if we think that one fifth of these students is dealing with a mental illness, something needs to be done. We cannot let these kids uh, just sit, sit being uneducated. Education, as we all know, is so important and these students will get better and will get the help they need if they are educated. This causes a ripple effect and yeah, it'll change the future. I'd like to close by saying uh, it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to suffer in silence. So please reach out to someone if you are struggling. And that's for anyone here tonight and uh, yeah, anyone watching at home. Thank you. Beautifully stated, Mr. Kelly, thank you. <clears throat> at this time, we move on to item number nine. Number nine is the non-agenda matters uh, within the jurisdiction of the board. This is for public comments about items that are not on the agenda this evening. Each speaker, as I mentioned before, and we have seen all evening, is allotted two minutes each. And so, Ms. Trujillo, do we have any folks calling in and or raising their hands on Zoom? Thank you, President For We do have uh, speakers on this item. I will call on three, Justin Shores, Sarah, and Sharon Jekot Jekotka. I will start with Justin Shores. Thank you. I just want to um, uh, put a, a public comment out for all the people who haven't given in to the, um, the coercion and all the pressure and the peer pressure from the, the students. I know there's a lot right now where, like, if you're not vaccinated, you're getting harassed and you're getting um, uh, discriminated against. Anyone out there that's not taking it, just just know that you're the brave ones. You're the ones that are, are thinking critically here. You're the ones that are saying, you know what, maybe I do want to see the data first. Maybe I do want to wait long term before I give this to my babies, my, my kids that haven't even had their own kids yet. So anyone out there that hasn't been pressured yet, stay strong. Just keep just keep at it. This is... This is just to break your spirit and break your soul. And they want you to, they want you to break. That's all they do. They want you to break here. So don't do it. Just, just know there's so many other people standing up, maybe not right, you know, right in your area, but just, just start looking around. There's, there's a lot of people standing up and saying, you know what, this is wrong. The government should not force anyone to do this stuff. This is, this is not right. So just anyone out there, you're, the board thinks you're uneducated. They think that they, they can educate you and and teach you better so just know you, you're doing the right thing okay because there's a lot of scientists a lot of doctors that are starting to speak out just start looking outside of california pretty much anywhere outside of california you'll get better information uh, cdph all of our local boards they all just go off of each other and and the federal government's mandates so it's late it doesn't make any sense Real people are saying, what? <laughs> What's going on? Wait, how is this happening? So just know you're the brave ones. You're the smart ones. And this board is um, just following what their orders, I guess, just doing what they're told. So um, keep it, keep strong. Hi. 
Next speaker is Sarah. Sarah, can you please state your full name? Hi, thank you. This is Sarah Anderson. And I also strongly oppose the student vaccine mandate. Mandating this vaccine will cause harm to many young people. We know that. We have no long-term data on how this will affect them. Why did some of the vaccines get stopped around the world recently? Because it is not safe. You are playing with our students' lives and we won't stand for it. The whole country is looking at California thinking, what is wrong with our leaders? Our kids are going to be test subjects. God gave me my children to care for, not you. And I will decide what is best for them, not you. Are you willing to have murder on your gravestone? Looks like you're okay with this. This is not caring for our students. We have many friends who have gotten their children vaccinated, and we respect that. That's their choice. I want my choice, and I will let my child get the vaccine when we feel it's ready and safe. Thank you. Next speaker is Sharon Jagotka. Hi, uh, this is Sharon Jagotka. Go ahead. My son uh, just returned home from school today and he informed me of his homework in health class. Um, I am disturbed by the animated video that was shown during class. It was, um, we are a Christian family and we do not approve that this kind of material is being taught to our young impressionable children. Why do you have to go to such extreme lengths to instill in these young children lies? Children are impressionable. Of course, they may feel awkward in their bodies and that is totally normal. Didn't you feel weird when you were a teen? Of course, I did, but that didn't mean I was a lesbian or confused about my gender. Thank God I wasn't being taught or told something else. Children are so confused about their gender because of the lies and trash they are being taught and shown at school. I know of a psychologist here in SB and, and that, that is counseling young girls because they are so confused with their gender. In the Bible, God said, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Genesis 127, leave their gender alone the way God intended it to be. And board members, you have allowed this filth to infiltrate our schools, the children's minds, and their homes when you approved Teen Talk. Hundreds of parents, grandparents, and concerned citizens were loudly opposed to Teen Talk, but you disregarded our voices, just like you are today. Shame on you, board members, for allowing such lies to be taught by teachers who may not approve. I hope you have a Bible at home because God's word says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Matthew 18, 6. This is God's word. God doesn't lie. Okay. We need to protect our children's innocence. You need to listen to the parents. Okay. I'm a parent and I'm concerned about what my child is being taught at school. Time. The last speaker is R.S. R.S., can you please state your full name? Uh, my name is Russell Swartz. Um, <clears throat> I didn't plan to talk tonight, but uh, <laughs> it turns out that this community is just full of crybabies. Um, I support a vaccine mandate fully. I support teachers being vaccinated. I support kids being vaccinated. I, I support good common sense governance and, and taking the advice of medical professionals who know so much more than I ever will uh, about what my body needs because uh, I don't study this stuff. <laughs> That's not my job. They, they do. And so they know this stuff. Um, to those who are unvaccinated and still listening, um, quit, quit crying. Go get your vaccine so that we can go back to normal. It's, it's not that hard. It's, it's 30 seconds. It's, it's an annoying 30 seconds. You sign some paperwork. They give you a lollipop and uh, respect you so much more. Sat in on this meeting and listened to just this awful nonsense. I am so sorry. Uh, that, that's my time. Here we have one more speaker, Ana Garcia. 
Yeah. Hi. Okay. Um, I am just, I wasn't planning on speaking on this item, but I just wanted to say that one, I'm glad that this meeting is being recorded um, and that people are being captured in their hateful uh, threats against the board and the community. Uh, I also want to amplify what was just said previously by RS. Um, you have a choice not to get vaccinated and that choice comes with consequences. If you don't want to be at a school where you have to get vaccinated, then don't be. Homeschool your kids. And third, there's this thing called church and state separation. So all of this God rhetoric is irrelevant. Don't bring it to the school. Thank you. Thank you, President Ford. That concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much, Ms. Trujillo. Board members, we're going on now to uh, agenda item E, to accept donations. Is there a motion to accept the donation of a $2,000 telescope to Santa Barbara High School for October 12th, 2021? So moved. Thank you, Ms. sims Moten. And a second? Ms. Munoz, thank you. Um, board members, all in favor of accepting this donation, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The motion to accept the donation passes unanimously. On to the consent agenda. Uh, just as a reminder, the consent agenda involves items uh, to approve that are considered routine, not likely to require any uh, additional discussion. Dr. Maldonado and her staff have recommended that the board approves all of the consent agenda items and also board members have had an opportunity to consider and ask questions about these items before tonight. So first of all, are there any public comments on the consent agenda items, Ms. Trujillo? We have one um, speaker on this item. Please. Claudia Henry. Hello, I'm not sure if number 14 falls under the consent item. It's about um, the financial approval to travel to the um, yes. state. Yes. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, so item 14, I suppose I strongly object to approving the travel monies for that. And I'm not exactly sure who it's for, whether, you know, just said superintendent, but just considering the warnings that we get that have to be renewed every 30 days to have the um, uh, COVID safe distance space in place for our meetings. It doesn't seem like, um, it seems like there's a disconnect then to have our superintendent or even anyone from the board or staff traveling to San Diego to a meeting with 3000 people. I'm sure they'll all be wearing masks, but I'm not sure if they'll be keeping safe distance. And if you look at the website, there's the alternative to attend in virtual with 2000 people. And I would really recommend doing that instead. I just think it sets sort of like a, well, this is for them, but I can do this sort of mentality. And we're all in this together and we don't want that. So, you know, one of the things on the website, it said that if you go to the meeting, you can meet other people and you can have an exchange of ideas. Well, we feel the same way but we're willing to you know, accept the situation because of the COVID distance requirements. But I think that your office and your, your board should accept the same things in consideration of this conference and the approval to travel and be with 3000 people. That, that's all I have to say. It's just, I would not encourage doing that as a, a bad public example. Thanks for listening. Thank you. We have one, um, one more public comment. Sharon Jagotka. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I just like to make a comment to that previous person and regarding. Um, uh, you know, I'm maybe... sorry, um, Ms. Jagotka, we cannot comment on prior. Um, this is only for uh, consent agenda items. Do you have a comment on any of the uh, well, agenda well, items? No, but I do want to make a comment that. Yeah, um, no, sorry, we can't. Take that. President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Before I call for a motion, board members or Dr. Maldonado, are there any items on the consent agenda that require more information, comments, or discussion for you? 
Seeing none, I would like to ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented on items F2 through 15. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. And the second? Ms. Second. Caps, thank you very much. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The consent agenda passes unanimously. Moving on to our action agenda. Number one, this is uh, the first action item is approval of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee Annual Report on Bond Measures. For this in uh, item, I'm going to turn it over to the Facilities and Planning Department. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Maldonado and members of the public. Uh, the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee meets quarterly to review, discuss, and provide guidance to staff related to current bond measures approved by the voters to fund capital improvement projects throughout the district. Uh, each year, the committee votes to approve annual reports, and then they subsequently bring them to your board for approval. Um, this evening, Frank Stevens, the committee chair, was intending to make this presentation, but uh, unfortunately had a, a scheduling conflict. So I'm going to introduce uh, another committee member, Mr. Lang Sly, who is here tonight to present the report. Uh, in Mr. Stevens' absence. So if Mr. Sly is available, he can give you the report. Okay, uh, hello, sound check, please. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, doesn't appear that I'm on the camera, but that's okay. Um, so good evening, uh, Board President Ford, board members, Dr. Maldonado, my name is Lang Sly. I'm the vice chair of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. And um, as Steve mentioned, um, I'm standing in tonight for Frank Stevens, our chair, who uh, otherwise would give this report, uh, who is unavailable tonight. Um, the title of the report is the SBUSD Measures I 2016 and J 2016. Citizens Bond Oversight Committee Annual Report to the Board of Education, June 2021. Uh, we, typically, we, we typically read this report. It has a somewhat formal uh, structure and there's some uh, replication because we're covering both measures I and J. And we also want the public to, to hear this and uh, uh, they would generally not have access to a written report, so I am going to read it. I apologize for, for that in advance, but uh, it is only about six minutes long. So here we go. Um, section one, the legal foundation for the committee. The measures I 2016 and J 2016 Citizens Bond Oversight Committee submits this report to the Board of Education. This report is issued in conformance with the Strict Accountability and Local School Construction Bonds Act of 2000, Proposition 39, and Assembly Bill 1908, requiring that the School District Board of Education form an independent citizens oversight committee and that this committee inform the public about the expenditures of bond funds. The CBOC wishes to thank the Santa Barbara Unified School District staff who have assisted us with ongoing support for the activities of the committee. We appreciate the opportunity to serve as citizens watchdog, in quotes, for residents of SBUSD, verifying that bond proceeds are expended only for the school projects on the ballot in conformity with the guidelines established with Proposition 39 and Assembly Bill 1908. Section two, formation of the committee and charges. The measures I 2016 and J 2016 CBOC was formed on March 13, 2017 as a result of the passage of SBUSD bond measures I 2016 and J 2016 under Proposition 39 rules, which allowed for the passage of the bond measure with a 55% vote as opposed to a two thirds vote required under Proposition 13. The school district must adhere to strict accountability guidelines in the execution of the bond spending per Proposition 39 and Assembly Bill 1908, including the formation of the CBOC. Bond measure I 2016, a $135 million bond authorization 
was passed by the voters in the SBUSD in November 2016 for the construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, or replacement of school facilities, including the furnishing and equipping of school facilities or the acquisition or lease of real property for school facilities. Bond measure J 2016, a $58 million bond authorization was also passed by the voters in the SB USD in November 2016 for the construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation, or replacement of school facilities, including the furnishing and equipping of school facilities or the acquisition or lease of real property for school facilities. The CBOC is appointed by the Board of Education and is charged by the state law to review the school district's use of measures I-2016 and J-2016 funds and to inform the public about those uses. The committee currently retains the appropriate community representation. Section three, uh, executive summary. And uh, bear with me, we're almost finished here. Uh, measure I-2016. The CBOC met for the first time on March 13, 2017 and has continued to meet and receive updates from district staff regarding district facilities activities. The CBOC has reviewed the project expenditures reports for measure I-2016, discussed the expenditures among members and questioned staff to ensure that the expenditures are consistent with and in compliance with the measure I-2016 ballot language. Additionally, the CBOC has visited sites under construction and received regular project updates for the work schedule through the program. The most recent reports contain data through June 30, 2021, and indicate that as, as of that date, from the total $100 million in bonds sold to date, there's $21,470,444 remaining available to measure I 2016 bond funds. We identified that no proceeds were spent on teacher salaries, administrative salaries, or on operational expenses. As reported to the committee, all of the funds have been spent on Measure I 2016 projects and the associated resources necessary to administer the projects and bond delivery cost. The committee has also received copies of the annual independent performance and financial audits for Measure I 2016. Next measure, J 2016. The CBOC met for the first time on March 13, 2017 and has continued to meet, receiving updates from district staff regarding district facilities activities. The CBOC has reviewed the project expenditures reports for measure J 2016, discussed the expenditures amongst members and questioned staff to ensure that the expenditures are consistent with and in compliance with the measure J 2016 ballot language. Additionally, the CBOC has visited sites under construction and received regular project updates and indicate that as of June 30, 2021, from the total $40 million in bonds sold to date, there is $22,435,901 remaining of available measure J 2016 bond funds. We identified that no proceeds were spent on teacher salaries, administrative salaries, or on operational expenses. As reported to the committee, all of the funds have been spent on Measure J 2016 projects and the associated resources necessary to administer the projects and bond delivery costs. The committee also has also received copies of the annual independent performance and financial audits for Measure J 2016. This report was approved by the committee at their meeting on September 20, 2021. Please do not hesitate to contact this committee if you have any concerns or questions regarding the expenditure of Measure I and J 2016 funds, respectfully submitted by Frank Stevens, Chair. I would like to add a footnote that uh, even though our formal report uh, acknowledges uh, the hard uh, work uh, 
and useful work that's done by staff uh, to enable the committee to do its job. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to reemphasize uh, that the information we get uh, through Frank Vizzolini, uh, prepared by him and the staff, has been uh, extremely helpful. It's been uh, timely, accurate, and uh, we always get our answers. So thank you to, uh, to Steve and the staff. Uh, and that concludes my report. Thank you so very much. And I do appreciate the work of the committee and also, of course, of Mr. Vizzolini. Uh, Mr. Hill, are there any public comments on this item? No public comment on this item. Oh, thank you. Board members, do you have any further questions or comments? I see none. So board members, may I have a motion to approve action item number one, the approval of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee Annual Report on Board Measures. Ms. Munoz? I so move. Thank you very much. And a second? Second. Great, Ms. Alvarez. Board members, all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. On to number two, the second action item is approval of the provisional internship permit. For this item, I will turn it over to Dr. Becchio. Thank you, good evening, Board President Ford, Board Members, Superintendent Maldonado. I bring before you a proposal for your approval. We are requesting to submit through the CTC for provisional internship um, permits or the three people listed on the agenda item. I did wanna point out these three individuals um, meet the three-year experience requirement that the CTC um, requires for us to be eligible to get a provisional internship permit. And I also wanted to point out that um, two of these were our paraeducators and the other did serve as a paraeducator. So I'm really proud of, of that advancement and them stepping into this um, teacher role for us this year. So I wanted to acknowledge these individuals as well. With that, I'll take any questions you might have. That's terrific. Uh, Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? No public comment on this item. Great, thank you. Um, board members, do you have any further comments or questions? Ms. Alvarez, please. I just have one comment. Are, are these employees aware of the classified employee grant program that they can get up to $4,000 a year to help with their tuition? I am not sure, but we will double check that tomorrow morning. Because so, I think yeah, that would be a idea. great fit for this employee. Yeah, I will Thank check you. on that tomorrow Thank morning. You. Terrific point. I see no other comments. So board members may have a motion to approve action item number two, the approval of the provisional internship permit. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. And a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Caps. Board members, all in favor of this action item, please raise your hand and, and say aye. 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 Perfect. The motion passes unanimously. On to number three. Is this you also, Dr. Becchio? This is the third agenda uh, action item, the approval of the employee transportation stipend. That's correct. So we're bringing forward this proposal to uh, provide a stipend of up to $200 a week, $40 a day for employees who have stepped into this um, area that has um, really been left vacant by the shortage of bus drivers that we in, um, encountered at the beginning of this school year. Uh, what we ended up doing was using our vans, renting vans, but to do that, we needed drivers. And so we used some of our current employees, both classified certificated, um, and also some management staff. And so what this proposal is, is to go retroactively and provide those individuals a $40 a day stipend. Most of them did this on a weekly basis, so it would be $200 for those individuals. And then moving forward through the school year, if we continue with this transportation plan, that those employees would be compensated uh, with that stipend each week that they continue to, to drive our students to and from school it's not part of their regular assignment. So that is the proposal that's before you. Happy to take any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much. Outstanding effort on the part of these employees. Mr. Heal, are there any public comments on this item? 
no public comment on this item. All right, thank you. Board members, do you have any further questions or comments on this item? Ms. Sims Moten, please. Yes, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the employees who stepped up and, and did that in the middle of that gap, you know, transportation gap. I have two questions. One is, is there a special license that they need to have to transport students? And then what is the insurance coverage? Is it from the district or is it using their private insurance? Well, is there, is Kim available to answer that? I believe they're, they're under our district coverage. Yeah, I can not answer. their own. You, you I that? can answer that. I did check uh, both Ms. Hernandez and I did check and CISC is covering the insurance for us. And they don't have to have a special license to transport just a they're, regular seat. They're using, their, they're using district vehicles or their own vehicles. So they should be covered by that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, board members may have a motion to approve action item number three, which is the approval of the employee transportation stipend. With gratitude, I so move. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten, and a second. I second. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. So all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously and thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm wondering, board members, since four, five, and six are action items that we can do at another time, I'd like to move ahead to number seven. Is this what you're yeah. suggesting? Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead to the approval of the placement and funding of a school resource deputy with the understanding it is not an action item tonight. It is a report item. Yes, thank you for that, board members. And again, I know this was an item that we placed on the agenda uh, over the weekend when we were able to get our contract back from the Sheriff's Department. Uh, we have been working on this uh, issue for a while, as was stated in the board report that Dr. Wagenick posted. I will ask her to come up and just share a little bit more about some of the background where this has been and ask for some guidance from board members as to any other uh, information you may need. I know that our student board member Dawson attends the school and also has some important information to share with us, uh, but I will ask for additional guidance from the board members. Thank you. Dr. Wagenek. Um, good evening again, Superintendent Maldonado, President Ford and board members. Um, so uh, I know that you've had an opportunity to read the background action item information that I've provided um, for the benefit of those in the audience. And uh, I'm going to summarize that in lieu of a report. Um, and also I've added some additional information that I think is important to um, this item tonight and future decisions. So for more than a decade, um, and I, I don't think you need to shut down. Let's, let's pull this down. Um, so for more than a decade and until June of 2017, we had had a school resource deputy on the campus of San Marcos High School. And that deputy was funded uh, by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office and through Santa Barbara County. In May of 2017, we were notified that that funding was no longer going to be um, provided and that if we wanted a school resource deputy in this district at San Marcos, that the district would need to pay in excess of $200,000 a year for that deputy. It was decided at that time as we were um, had already actually uh, completed our budget preparations for the 2018-19 school year that we would uh, utilize dispatch deputies to respond to the school as needed. And as I believe both Ms. Sims Moten and Ms. Caps, who were on the board at that time remember, um, things came to a head in the spring of 2018 that was uh, spring of 2018 was after the Thomas fire and the debris flow, which has ha had had a huge impact on our community. It was also when the um, San Marcos um, social media threat incident uh, occurred. It was also when the Parkland shooting occurred and many other shootings in the country. 
Um, and on top of that, um, we had an incident at San Marcos that led to a lockdown. That kicked off a time when we really launched a full, full scale um, task force to look at safety uh, in our district. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that was an opportunity that we really took advantage of. And part of that um, resulted in the board voting to fund a school resource deputy. Um, we have continued to fund the school resource deputy since that time to ensure the safety and well being of the 2,200 plus students and staff who are on that campus each day. Now, the role of the school resource um, deputy, uh, it wasn't like uh, the board said, we want a deputy and do your thing. Rather, and I, I remember Ms. Sims Mote very pointedly, you know, saying, we want that person to be trained in de-escalation. We want that individual to have anti-bias training and be well-versed in restorative justice and restorative practices. Um, that required negotiations with the sheriff's office. Um, and in 2019, an agreement was reached between the sheriff's office and Santa Barbara Unified uh, leadership that deputies would follow the model of the National Association of School Resource Officers in which SRDs serve in a, a capacity of law enforcement, a teacher, wherein they are a guest speaker, and then an informal uh, counselor. That's a triad um, approach. In addition, it was agreed that no school administrator would ask or expect the school resource deputy to conduct their work uh, for them, that it is the role of the school administrator to do their work, and that school discipline and what we now refer to as response to behavior would be done by school administrators, not by resource deputies. For example, a school resource deputy would not be asked to investigate student behavior incident that did not rise to the level of a crime. Furthermore, it was agreed that a, a school resource deputy would not participate in decision making related to student behavior and discipline. But at the same time, it was agreed that if a crime is committed um, that threatened the safety of students or staff, the SRD would investigate and make decisions related to arrest and charges against individuals as appropriate. Finally, it was agreed that at all times, investigations um, as needed would run in parallel and that both parties, administrators and law enforcement, have a responsibility to allow the other to conduct their own business while at the same time working as a team to provide support to each other for the purpose of ensuring the safety of the school community. Each month, uh, part of what came out of that was that each month the SRD submits a log of their work for that month to Principal Glazer and to myself. Examples, and I think it's important uh, to review some of the examples from the August log, and this is including but not limited to, um, giving citations for drivers on Hollister Avenue who are not abiding by the law as students are walking in the crosswalk on their way to school. So I use that as an example because that is protecting our students from external threats, threats to their physical safety on their way to school. Another example is responding to report a report of an individual camping in the bushes on campus during school hours. Again, an external threat to the safety of the students assisting a parent whose child had not returned home. And finally, conducting a threat assessment of a student who made a social media threat against another high school. So what's the current status? Uh, we do not have a signed contract at this time. Um, 
however, the school resource uh, deputy, Deputy Sean Hampton, has been providing services since August of 2021. The SRD has been serving on campus um, for this entire time, and there has been a delay in bringing this contract to the board um, because there has been opposition to its approval by a number of community members and organizations who um, are concerned that the impact of the presence of law enforcement on campus um, it has a deleterious effect on students, especially BIPOC students who have experienced trauma resulting from past interactions with law enforcement. Therefore, two listening uh, sessions were held in September and early October of 2021. The first meeting was with the student group Pops Off Campus SB. The second meeting was with adults from various organizations, including Standing Up for Racial Justice SB, which is known as SURGE, as well as Ethnic Studies Now. A third meeting was held with leaders uh, from the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office and representatives of Pops Off Campus SB, um, the Ethnic Studies Club, and um, our own Mr. Kelly, and another Sam Marcus student who he invited, and I appreciate Mr. Kelly um, bringing together diverse opinions from the campus to that meeting. The community organizations and uh, student groups that were invited to those, uh, there were there were organizations and student groups invited to the meeting and some chose not to attend. Um, and we understand that. Um, in attendance at all of these meetings were Superintendent Maldonado, uh, members of the superintendent's cabinet, including myself, Mr. Venz, and Ms. Carey, as well as all four of our high school principals. Um, the fiscal impact currently of the contract uh, is $154,771 for the contract for this year. That includes up to, or that includes 1,440 hours of the deputy's time. Now on to the recommendation. Um, In the time since the spring of 2018, San Marcos High School, like many of our campuses, has experienced a, a number of lockdowns and lockouts because of external threats and perceived internal threats. Of the perceived inter internal threats, one occurred near the library uh, back in 2018 when an M80 firecracker, which simulates artillery fire, was exploded near the library. There was no SRD on campus at that time. However, the Santa Barbara Sheriff's commander mobilized a response that, that resulted in deputies quickly being on campus. And while the lockdown occurred, the deputies cleared the school, dismissed the lockout within one hour. In another incident, a student walking near the gym, the gym turnaround, uh, saw a man holding what she believed to be a gun. This happened several years ago. She reported this to administration and a lockdown was called. The SRD was not on campus at this time. However, patrol deputies responded in approximately three minutes. It was ultimately determined that the man's car had broken down and he had pulled into the San Marcos parking lot to work on his car. The deputies determined that, in fact, he was holding a radiator hose that did look, from a distance, a lot like a gun. Of the two external threats that led to lockout or lockdown, one was because of a law enforcement response to an apartment building across the street from the school, which resulted in the death of an individual who was being served a warrant. The second was last spring when murders occurred approximately half a mile from the school in a residential area. I bring these to your attention because I think it's important to understand um, both external threats 
and internal perceived threats. Um, so it's um, recommended that the contract be amended this year such that the school resource deputy patrol the perimeter of the campus and the area surrounding the school, entering the campus interior only when requested by school administrators in order to respond to extreme issues of safety. The focus of law enforcement should be to protect schools from external threats. That should be their primary focus. The regular presence of law enforcement on campus can send a message that the danger is internal. And this is something that we are aware of. This is something that we have discussed with students, with community members, and with the sheriff's office itself. Safety is both physical and emotional, and it's important that we recognize both. And therefore, the recommendation is that we do um, extend this contract, but that it be amended such that the SRD focus primarily on those external threats. And with that, I will uh, open it up for questions and comments. Dr. Maldonado, did you have anything else you'd like to add? Thank you, Dr. Wagenick. Thank you to Dr. Wagenick. And again, board members, I'm seeking uh, your guidance here with this, this uh, uh, report. And I want to recognize all the emails that we have received uh, today. And I'll thank uh, those who have um, written to us on this important topic. Thank you very much. I too want to thank the public for reaching out to us. I want you to know we have read and noted your opinions, your concerns, your ideas, your hopes and your dreams. And uh, now we will go to public comments on this item. Ms. Trujillo, please. Thank you, President, for we do have public comment on this item. I will call five names at a time so that the public can be ready. When I give you access to speak, please state your, your full name. Thank you. First five speakers are Chrisita Silvers, Rachel Cole, Lauren Quedent, Kim Cascades, and Taj, Tajay. I will start with Chrisita Silvers. Good evening. Uh, my name is Cressida Silvers uh, and I'm a parent at San Marcos. And I ask you not to renew the contract for an armed deputy. I was grateful to see your recent update of discipline policies based on data. Dr. Wagenick effectively presented on disproportionality of exclusion in our schools. And President Ford spoke about getting rid of the school to prison pipeline. However, no mention, no one mentioned the significant and well-documented role SROs play in both of these mechanisms of injustice. Ms. Cap spoke about fulfilling the black student demand for de-escalation training, but let's not forget that the original demand was for the removal of law enforcement from campuses and they changed it under pressure. An armed presence in our schools may comfort some, but it's really important to understand here that the research findings do not show an actual increase in safety. On the contrary, data show the presence of SROs decreases safety for many. Experiences of students and alumni across our district back up those statistics. So this false sense of security for some is at the very real and documented expense of other people's children. And as a mom, I'm just not okay with that. None of us should be okay with that. The presence of law enforcement in our schools works against the needs of our children. We cannot discuss disproportionality of exclusion and restoration approach, restorative approaches and revamping the old philosophy of school discipline with the new without acknowledging the detrimental impacts on our children of SROs. Instead, let's work towards a system that supports the real safety, education, and well being of all of our students. A system that supports students who show signs of struggle rather than criminalizing them and amplifying those struggles. We must reject this notion that SROs are, are the solution or that they're somehow required. They're trained in law enforcement period. If we need them, we can call them. But if we want mental health support, then let's put money towards professionals trained in those fields. Please apply the funds to support our children and not criminalize them for being children. Thank you. Time. Thank you. Next speaker is Rachel Cole. Hello, my name is Rachel Cole and I ask that you do not renew this contract. 
SRLs harm each and every student, and this budget affects all students and all Santa Barbara community members. The money spent on SROs is money that is directly stolen from our students. This money is directly stolen from resources that could help students, such as much needed counseling services, while exposing many students to the stress of armed officers racially profiling their hallways. With SROs in our school district, children remain susceptible to the violence and trauma that is statistically caused by and not prevented by SROs. Those who are most affected by these officers, the students have submitted numerous comments giving examples of officers racially profiling and intervening in discipline when students have not broken any existing rules. The students are speaking out to tell us that these officers are what threaten their safety, not the aforementioned fireworks or men carrying household items across the street. Those of us who have more advantage in the system have a role to play by demanding change from within by divesting in SROs. I stand with the Youth Coalition and hope that you do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lorian Quadent. Oh, I'm sorry. One second. Hello, my name is Lauren Quande, and I am a community member, San Marcos alumni, and a parent to future SB Unified students. Um, I'm here today to read the public comment of a member of the Youth Coalition. Um, I'm going to begin reading her comment now. Hello, today I'm not here giving my comment because I don't feel safe doing so, and that should tell you a lot about how little you all do to protect your BIPOC students. I am here today to remind you that cops don't belong on campus. Last time I checked, these are schools, not prisons. You claim they keep us safe, but who will keep us safe from them, from their harassment, from their guns? I want you all to realize that the people who feel safe with cops on campus are the ones who have the privilege to be served by them. The people who feel safe with cops around are the ones who haven't seen people that look like them be murdered by cops. Every child, every chance, every day. I suggest every child should be taken out of your mission statement because if you were really serving every child, this whole conversation about cops on campus wouldn't happen because you'd willingly find better alternatives to school safety. And if things go like I think it might, you all will once again listen to the white parents who always seem to get what they want no matter who gets hurt. Listen to your students for once and it should only take one student for you to take action. That is if you're really here to serve every child. Lastly, I know that many of you are hesitant about taking a step towards eliminating cops on campus because you fear the chaos will ensue. But there are better alternatives to cops and we all know that. And once again, I say, listen to your students to know what they need and you'll get your answers to better alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Kim Pascase. Hello, board members and superintendent. I'm a parent of a student at San Marcos High School. Recently, the school district revised your discipline practices. You looked at data and came to the conclusion that students of color were disproportionately impacted and real changes needed to be made. We are asking you to do the very same thing with student resource officers on our school campuses. This is the missing piece that was not discussed in your restorative justice discipline practices. Overwhelming research shows that SROs heavily contribute to the school to prison pipeline. I have been in several listening meetings with the Youth Coalition that launched the Instagram campaign Cough Off Campus SB, and I want to honor their efforts and work to push the needle on this conversation. As I look at the data and research that backs up the testimonies they collected, I see clearly that as a white parent, I can no longer expect the cops to keep my children safe at the expense of black and brown students who live in fear of armed guards on or, on or around our school campuses. It is not okay for some students to feel safe and others to feel terrorized and in danger from the very personnel that our district pays for. I know as a parent, we fear school shootings. I hear other parents say, I just feel safer with a police officer on campus, but we can't make policies on feelings. There is no data that the district has presented that shows SROs improve safety. There was an SRO at Parkland and still 17 fatalities occurred. In regards to gun violence in schools, SROs had a 1.5% success rate. There is no program in our district that would get funding for a 1.5% success rate. 
To be clear, no school district is required to allocate any part of its educational dollars to policing our schools. The school board decides whether or not to place and pay for police in schools. I ask the school board to be brave and do what is best for our diverse student body. Other district leaders across the nation in California are becoming aware of the irrefutable evidence and removing police from campus. They have taken the step to reimagine safety and you can too. There is a totally different liaison position that could happen that doesn't need this amount of funding and can ensure. Fine. Next speaker is Ty J. If you can state your full name, please. Hello, my name is Taj Pascage, and I am a 10th grader at San Marcos High School. To be honest, most of my high school experience has been on Zoom due to COVID, so I have not had much interaction with our police officer at San Marcos. But in talking to friends and looking at some of the research and reading the testimonies that the Youth Coalition has gathered, it is clear that I stand with the Youth Coalition and ask you not to renew the contract with the Sheriff's Office for the police officer at San Marcos High School. As I look at the student testimonies, I see a disparity between the experiences of students of color and white students like myself. I see that non-white students feel afraid, violated, harassed, experienced intense anxiety, felt mistrusted and harmed around SROs on our school campuses. The data shows that SROs have not been effective. When police are in schools, students can feel less connected with the school, less trusting of the adults and less safe. The arrest rates for schools with SROs were 3.5 times the rate of those without SROs. And in some states, the arrest rates are as, much, uh, are as high as eight times the rate of schools without. How can all students in Santa Barbara Unified School Districts learn and achieve our educational goals when marginalized students are having such a different experience and being criminalized on our school campuses? This difference that I see in SROs interact with at school is harmful and dangerous. No one should want this harm to continue. The police are a phone call away if there is a serious incident that needs attention, but they should not be stationed on our school campuses. Please do not renew this contract with the sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. The next five speakers are Alethea Tyner, Gina Brady, Walid Afifi, Carrie Hutchinson, Alexandra Hamil. I will start with Alethea Tyner. Hello, I am a professor at Santa Barbara City College. I'm also a mom of DPHS graduate and an aunt to current Santa Barbara Unified High School students. From these various contexts, we can emphatically declare that SROs do not keep our campuses safer. Parents know this, teachers know this, kids know this, and the data shows that the presence of an armed officer on campus actually increases the likelihood of violence and trauma against the students, particularly students of color. I have many anecdotes and my, uh, my students' firsthand interactions with SROs that were unnecessarily aggressive and punitive. I don't understand why we are spending money to turn up the temperature on conflict rather than investing in student well being and de escalation practices. I stand with the Youth Coalition and emphatically support defunding SROs at the Santa Barbara Unified School District. A congressional research study using nationally representative sampling of U.S. public schools with data collection over time, quote, found no evidence suggesting that SRO or other law enforcement officers contribute to school safety and instead show that, quote, as schools increase their use of police officers, the percentage of crimes involving non-serious violent offenses that are reported to law enforcement increases. An end quote. The bottom line is that the presence of police officers helps redefine disciplinary situations as criminal justice problems rather than social problems and increases the like likelihood that students will be arrested at school. I implore you all to rethink this. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Gina Brady. Hello, I have some testimonies from students, so I'll be reading those first. One, I was sexually assaulted by a very well-known student on campus, and I approached my SRO to help me with the issue, and he just gaslighted me and told me that I should not be dressing like how I'm dressing, and I should be more careful with the partners that I choose. Number two, 
My SRO at school threatened me for hosting an information session on ACAB, and he said that I am anti-government and anti-American, even though I was born and raised here. Having undocumented parents, his statements made me feel extremely unsafe and unwanted, which is not the way I should feel at my school. Um, I understand that the presence of SROs on campuses is well-intentioned, with that intention being to stop crime and to keep our students safe, but I also understand that study after study, as well as our own testimonies from our own school district has shown that their presence on campus only perpetuates the exact issues that we're trying to address. And I also strongly believe that those, that $154,000 of funding should be reallocated towards mental health services and other services that can more properly address these issues. Um, I just also want to remind you guys that well, I know this is your day-to-day -day job. These, this is the future of our youth. These are real lives. These are our children's lives. And just to remind you of the gravity of the decision that's being made here. So I do hope that you reflect properly on this issue before making any decisions. And I do appreciate you hearing out the public and taking that responsibility seriously. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Walid Afifi. Yeah, hi, I'm Walid Afifi. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to speak. I'm a professor in the Department of Communication at UCSB. Um, I just wanted to just speak in form a little bit about this issue. I'm also, by the way, a parent actually of two San Marcos students. Um, so one of the things that was mentioned was that the one incident within three minutes, um, a police officer was called and arrived on scene. I think that's important data. And one of the things that, um, because one of the things that we know about SROs is that they're not effective. So uh, 2018, when you were considering this, I helped co-author a piece, uh, a report on the, the data, the, 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 the many studies that have been conducted on this that show them to be ineffective. Here's one that was published in 2020 in Criminology and Public Policy, titled Effects of School Resource Officers on School Crime and Responses to School Crime. The abstract on policy implications says, quote, the study findings suggest that increasing SROs does not improve school safety and that by increasing exclusionary responses to school discipline incidents, it increases the criminalization of school discipline. We recommend that educational decision makers seeking to enhance school safety consider the many alternatives to programs that require regular police presence in schools. You're going to hear from a lot of students, many of them uh, students of color who have had really negative interactions with SROs. This is not surprising. The data predict this very clearly. Uh, and we, you've many times spoken to the commitment to Black lives and the commitment to students. Um, yet this is one area that seems to be really difficult to actually hear them and hear their experiences. And so I really urge you to, in fact, follow up on those commitments to actually listen to people of color and to students of color in this case. Um, to end, I just wanted to, to really wish and hope that, that, that to, to really consider, um, and, and I guess to question um, how often we consider adding $200,000 for mental health resources. This is an incredible gap that must be filled. So if we're considering a school resource officer, then we must consider more uh, mental health uh, resources. Finally, not allowing them inside, living outside. I'm still worried about the administrative decisions to allow someone inside and how biased that might be. Thank you. Time. Thank you. Next speaker is Carrie Hutchinson. Good evening. My name is Carrie Hutchinson, and I'm speaking tonight as a parent with a high schooler in the district. Since 2019, I've made several public comments asking you to reconsider having armed officers on school campuses based on clear and widely available data on how they harm children and how they fail to make schools safer. Things have changed quite a bit in our collective awareness over the past few years, so my hope is that this time the board is listening with new knowledge and new awareness. I take issue with the way the information was presented tonight because we know that you are aware of the research on SROs or SRDs and how it speaks volumes over the anecdotal stories told tonight. You are aware that police on school campuses dole out more frequent and severe punitive measures for students of color than white students who commit the exact same transgressions. You are aware that there is no evidence that they increase campus safety. You are aware of the evidence that they create additional psychological and emotional harm for our most marginalized students, and not only students of color, but also LGBTQ students, as well as those who are neurodivergent. But what good is this awareness without behavior that backs it up? It is nothing. Awareness alone does nothing to address inequities. 
That's why I stand with the Youth Coalition and my position is firm. Knowing the research, hearing it reinforced by students you serve and other concerned community members and still allowing armed police officers on school campuses is no longer an acceptable choice from the adults in whom we entrust our children's care and safety. My child is now in junior year with less than two years to be served by the district. Now is the time. Please take this step to regain the trust of students and families you serve by following the lead of other districts and taking the necessary steps to remove police from our campus. Start tonight by voting no on the San Marcos SRD contract renewal. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alexander Hamill. Hamill, sorry about that. Hello, thank you. My name is Alexandra Hamill. I live here in Santa Barbara and I am a San Marcos graduate with two sons. Uh, the Youth Coalition here in Santa Barbara has asked the community to share their experiences with SROs. Many have chosen to remain anonymous because they fear retaliation for speaking out publicly. So I would like to share two of these anonymous testimonies. One incident that I recall, this is the quote, one incident I recall happened regularly with police officers attending football games to provide security. Often they end up following students of color that dress a certain way or associate with a certain group. Any student that is dressed or associated with a gang or other group will be targeted intentionally by the police. Those specific students are just chilling together, watching the game, but are continu continually harassed by police. There may be students in the group that have previously committed crimes, but I strongly believe that if connection and relationship is built by school staff with marginalized students, that SROs would not be needed. That's a SBHS anonymous student. The other firsthand, this is another quote, the other firsthand experience I have, the only firsthand experience I have with an SRO was at a public forum when I asked the question, I asked what type of education or training he had on the on top of, a, of implicit bias. And he said he was not familiar with that term and did not know what I was referring to. That was the parent. Please do not renew the SRO contract and instead fund resources that will help students thrive. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next five speakers are Olivia Miller, Noel Cabrera, Felicity Landa, Leslie Sanderson, and Avery Boss. I'll begin with Olivia Miller. Hi there, my name is Olivia Miller and I am a sophomore at San Marcos High School. I ask you not to renew the SRO contract. I not only feel unsafe with the presence of having a cop on campus, but view the Santa Barbara School District as behind with the recent political movements. To elaborate, over the summer of 2020 with the death of George Floyd, followed by the Black Lives Matter protests, the corruption of the police system came to light. The systematic racism that the police system perpetuates came to the awareness of many, including students like myself. Studies done clearly show the biases and prejudices that police officers consciously and subconsciously operate off of. Officers on campus are likely to target students of color, students a part of the LGBTQ plus community, and students with disabilities. It sickens me to my stomach knowing that the school has access to this information, but is still choosing to have a cop on campus, protecting the students that fit in with the dominant culture rather than the whole student body. Please vote no on renewing the SRL contract tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Noel Cabrera. Um, one second, please. I'm not able to give her access to speak. One second. One second. I'm going to go to the next speaker. I'll come back to Noel. Um, next speaker is Felicita Landa. Hello, my name is Felicity Landa. I'm a community member, parent of future Santa Barbara School District students beginning next year and resident of Santa Barbara. I'm writing to you today to say that I stand with the Youth Coalition to ask you not to renew the contract 
for $154,771,000 with the Sheriff's Office for the SRD at San Marcos High School. The SROs need to be removed altogether from the district. That funding should be directed towards resources that will help all students succeed and thrive. Students would be better served if money allocated to pay for them was instead spent on support services that have proven to be better for K through 12 st students, such as culturally competent mental health resources, therapists, and restorative justice training. School boards across our county are seeing the research that SROs do not keep school campuses safer. Data from this research, which has been linked for you, I'm sure, in many of the emails you received today, has been conducted across the nation to support this shift and testimonials, testimonials from our community, as you've heard tonight and elsewhere show that our students' experiences mirror those reported in the research. The two instances of inside threats that were spoken about today, I'm sure it wasn't lost on everyone that in both of those instances, the SRD wasn't even there, and yet the police were able to come within minutes. Both of those instances are just examples of how SRDs are not needed, even just patrolling outside. I have been reading the anonymous shares um, of experiences of students, and they are truly heartbreaking, and I really encourage you to check out the Instagram page um, for Cops Off Campus SB and to read some of those stories because they make my stomach turn and I stand firmly with these students, with these parents, and as a parent myself um, in voting no to not renew this contract and to get cops off the campuses. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Noel Cabrera, can you please update your Zoom account so that you are able to speak. I'm not able to give you access and come back. I'll get back to you. Um, our next speaker is Leslie Sanderson. Hello, board. Um, I'm just uh, wondering these listening sessions that were had, um, were they just invited people because I remember attending all of the meetings where there were parents demanding an SRO, and I don't see any of them speaking tonight. Um, I understand the data on SROs and um, the reason why people don't want them. Uh, I do have a son with a disability, um, but I had emailed the entire board earlier this year about the security issues that I noted at San Marcos, specifically around the adult uh, transition program for students with disabilities. First, them removing sinks and outdoor seating because of all the transients that were uh, living there uh, and taking away all the equipment of students uh, that use that program fencing of areas so the students couldn't use it anymore because of the transient issue. Then the second week of school, the classroom got broken into all of the students with disabilities, iPads and adaptive equipment was stolen. Some of it use it for communication. Um, and then the multiple times where the school vans are uh, graffitied. Really, it doesn't, it is a, um, security issue. It shouldn't be a harassing a student issue. I don't know if SROs are the best way to do it, but evidently we need some more security or cameras or police response in order to keep the campus safe for the students that are there and not have to keep out ripping out of equipment because transients are using the area. Thank you. Thank you. The next five speakers are Kavya Shuresh, Barbara Parme, Daisy Beeman, Pam Flynn Tumbo, Kite Klawu. And I apologize if I don't say your name correct. I will start with Kavya Suresh. Good evening, Santa Barbara Unified Board of Education and District Administrators. My name is Kavya Suresh, and I am a sophomore at San Marcos Senior High School. On behalf of the Cops Off Campus Youth Coalition, Santa Bar San Marcos Senior High Ethnic Studies Club, I'm coming to you all today with the request that you do not renew the contract with the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department for the Student Resource Deputy at San Marcos. Research demonstrates that Black Indigenous students of color, neurodivergent students, religious minority students, and LGBTQIA students 
all of which constitute a large part of our student body are disproportionately harmed by police presence on campus. We are here to ask you to make this decision in the interest of these students, in the interest of all students who have been systemically oppressed and marginalized by the institution of police. I want to clarify that our issue is not the student resource deputy himself on the San Marcos campus. Our issue is the institutional racism, transphobia, xenophobia, and ableism exerted by the system of police. We continue to hear stories of police brutality and violence, and we see with our own eyes the divisive and hostile effect police presence has in our country. The generational and ancestral trauma students experience because of police cannot be repaired by hiring a different SRD or having them just monitor the perimeter. It requires radical community healing and unity. The first step to achieving that would be removing police presence from our campus and reallocating the funding invested in the SRD to work higher quality mental health resources and professionals on our school campus. In addition, we have worked to collect meaningful and vulnerable testimonies from SB Unified students and community members that we encourage you to read. Renewing this contract with a minor compromise would be invalidating and muting these voices once again. I implore you to think of all students you serve as board members when thinking about renewing this contract. We take pride in being a student-centered district, so please consider the needs and safety of all your students, especially those who have been historically underserved by our society. Please, don't continue to promote inequity and division in our district and do not renew the contract with the Sheriff's Department for the San Marcos SRD. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Barbara Parme. Thank you, school board members. I'm sorry. My name is, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you, school board members. My name is Barbara Parmet. Please vote no on the renewal of the Sheriff's SRD contract with San Marcos High School. I believe in the testimonies which the Youth Coalition has gathered. Our youth of color are the experts, so I ask you to believe them. The point I would like to emphasize is that feeling safe is not the same as being safe. And as the Youth Coalition has shown, all evidence points to the fact that it is a delusion and a false narrative to claim feelings of safety around armed officers on campus. The ACLU and the FBI found in 160 incidents that the presence of on-campus officers do not prevent shootings. So please do not keep repeating the false narrative that SRDs keep us safe. These false narratives must be countered by the data, the evidence showing the SROs harm our students' mental and physical well being. So please do not approve of the SRD contract at San Marcos High School. Please listen to our youth of color. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker is Daisy Beeman. Greetings school board members. I am Daisy Beeman, a Santa Barbara community member. I am sharing an experience by a youth coalition member who fear retaliation for speaking out publicly. She says, I am a brown girl. Someone found a jewel on the classroom floor and then turned it into the SRO on campus. He pulled me out of my English class and asked to look through my stuff. The jewel belonged to my friend, but her stuff never got searched. The SRO spilled out all the contents of my backpack and kept me for the rest of the English and the beginning of PE. He let me go, but issued a warning. My friend was extremely relieved. It's clear that my brown skin made me subject to being searched, despite my innocence. And he didn't even help me collect my stuff. He just told me to go back to class. I was humiliated. This is from a DPHS student. My thoughts are, please do not renew the SRO contract. Instead, find resources that will help students thrive. I stand with the Youth Coalition and ask for healing for the trauma caused and prevent traumas that will be caused if you renew that contract. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Pam Flint. Thank you. I'm Pam Flint Tambo, Chair Ford and members of the board. I'm with the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara, and we strongly recommend that the board end the practice of policing on school campuses. And in particular, we request that you do not renew the counterproductive contract between the County Sheriff's Office and the MOU for San Marcos High School. If the board decides to continue contracting with the Sheriff's Office at San Marcos High School, then we recommend a revised MOU that contains a lower number of hours on campus and higher requirements for training for any routine police presence on campus. Specifically, law enforcement officers placed in schools should have training in child and youth development because we know that children's brains are not the same as adults. The officers also should be trained in implicit bias to prevent harsher views of Latinx, Black, and disabled students. And of course, they must be trained in de-escalation and restorative practices. The League of Women Voters supports the work of the Youth Coalition Santa Barbara and recommends that the board reconsider contracting MOUs for police in schools. We support and appreciate the newer holistic philosophy of responding first to the underlying needs of a student rather than the old routine of first focusing on a punitive response to misbehaviors. We enthusiastically support the school board as you continue in funding the staffing needed to implement restorative justice policies. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Kite Plawu. Hi, my name is Kate Glover and I'm a student at Santa Barbara High School. Um, the Youth Coalition here in Santa Barbara has asked the community to share their experiences with SROs. Many have chosen to remain anonymous because they fear retaliation for speaking out publicly. So I would like to share some of these anonymous testimonies with you. First one is, it's almost unbelievable the number of times I've been stopped by officers on campus to have them search my backpack. They always pull me over during class and ask to check my stuff because they have reasonable suspicion that I have drugs or weapons in my backpack. I don't have anything of the sort, so I know it's just a characteristic example of racial profiling. This was from an SBHS student. The next one I have is also from an SBHS student. Mistrust of SROs on school campuses has much to do with our experiences that students have faced in their communities with the police. Students of color have significantly more negative experiences than white students with police officers. SROs often, but not always, depending on the relationship of the SROs has with the student, will approach certain students of color with aggression, both in their body language, as well as how they speak down to them from their position of authority. Ultimately, SROs on campus communicate that school is not a safe place. Please do not renew the SRO contract. Instead, fund resources that will help students thrive. Thank you. Thank you. The next five speakers are Chelsea Mum, Lena Mollett, Chelsea Lancaster, Jenny Sperling, Dallin Penny, now we'll start with Chelsea Mum. Hi, my name is Chelsea Mum, and I'm a graduate of San Marcos High School, and my children are future students of the Santa Barbara School District. I am asking you to not renew the SRO contract and instead fund resources that will help our students thrive. I support the Youth Coalition here in Santa Barbara, and I'm going to share two anonymous testimonies from uh, that they have collected. The first is from a Santa Barbara High School student who says, I believe that funds that are usually set aside to have an SRO on campus can be utilized to train school staff in fostering healthy, positive relationships and training in de-escalating techniques would benefit the school community immensely. And here's a comment from a Santa Barbara Unified School District teacher. 
I have seen peer counseling, student leadership that actually had the power to change things at the school and other student led and student first initiatives change the school culture. Bringing these questions to the students themselves and truly allowing space for their answers can be transformative in ways that top-down discipline can never be. It works on the classroom level and the school level. And that's the end of the quote. Thank you so much for your time and for listening to our student staff and community as well as available research. Please do not renew this SRO contract. Thank you. The next speaker is Lena Mollett. My name is Lena Mallet, and I work at Freedom for Youth, a local grassroots nonprofit that empowers youth that are either system or justice impacted. The youth that we support attend both middle school and high school within SBUSD, and each one has voiced deficiencies in the school's mental health services and continually express anxieties about sharing educational spaces with police officers. I support the Youth Coalition and I too will share two anonymous um, experiences that students have had with SROs. The first one is from a DP High student, quote, this isn't really about SROs, but I tried talking to people at my school about restorative justice and many of them have told me that they would prefer a system where they have a say and they have a greater contribution to resolving conflict because a lot of the times adults or people of authority can instigate conflict and create a further divide. Instead, if we as students were allowed to take initiative and solve our own problems, we would form closer bonds and be able to resolve conflict faster. The second comes from a San Marcos High student, quote, restorative justice and alternative conflict resolution is the best way to help students create a better and safer school. After all, we all have the potential to resolve our own conflicts. We are always taught to use our words, but officers on campus almost always use violent and aggressive measures to diffuse conflict at school. They don't represent the values of our school or society. Again, we ask you please to not review the SRO contract and instead fund resources that will encourage and empower healing. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Chelsea Lancaster. Hello, good evening. Um, I, was, I was heartened to hear uh, Virginia Estrada uh, name that as a district, we make data informed decisions earlier on the subject of COVID. I wanna remind everybody that we have been de dealing with a dual epidemic um, uh, the past few years and on the subject of racism and systemic racism um, forever. So if we name and we commit to making data informed decisions, um, we have to do that on the subject of getting cops off campus and SROs off campus. I, re I uh, invite y'all to reject the false fear mongering happening. Um, Fran, with, with all due respect, I don't think you believe the things that you said earlier. Um, none of what you said uh, points to the need for a student resource officer. I also want to bring into the room the story of Mon Mona Rodriguez, an 18-year-old high school student and young mother who was just murdered by an off-campus SRO in Long Beach, and the Black Lives Matter movement is organized um, around uh, that issue right now. I also want to name when we think about the Sheriff's Department, um, we've been naming the Sheriff's Department is a racist, xenophobic organization for years, and we now have a Sheriff's da dashboard of it. So um, I suggest that y'all go look at the Sheriff's dashboard. Um, over 70% of people in our Santa Barbara County Jail are people of color. Um, these are our students' family members, they're their friends, and they could be our students if we continue to willingly participate in the school to prison pipeline. Uh, so please make the right choice, be on the right side of history, and get ops off, cops off our campus and listen to our youth. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Jenny Sperling. Hi there. My name is Jenny Sperling, and I stand with the Youth Coalition and other community partners in school districts across California and the nation to ask you to not renew the contract. <clears throat> With each of your votes in approval of this contract, you individually agree that putting students at risk is more important than creating a community response effort based on restorative justice, community love, and radical care. 
The youth coalition has shared vulnerable experiences filled with harm, control, and trauma. Their stories need to be respected and their futures need to be protected. Your compromise reads that the SRD will primarily patrol the perimeter and the surrounding areas. This is surveillance and supports forms of carceral logics. What I mean is that this compromise is based on purposeful scare tactics and measures that do not make school a safe place for our systems affected youth, but in fact reproduce what happens at prisons, a rotating fear inducing patrolling guard. Our students do not deserve any of this. In conclusion, I push, you, I push all of you to think about what safety really means to you. And if you believe police make you feel safe and be safe. And then I want you to think about how your responses to these questions are gendered, racialized, and classed, and what that means for our students in schools. Police, like we know, were not created for systems affected youth to feel protected. Police are primarily focused on only keeping white students safe. We know what this means for our Black, Latinx, <coughs> Indigenous, undocumented, disabled, and LGBTQIA plus students. Please do not move forward with this contract. Our community needs to heal and grow. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. The next speaker is Dellen Penny. Good evening. My name is Dallin Penny and I'm a member of this community and I stand with the Youth Coalition. If having armed officers walk into and around your children's classrooms sits fine with you, then you are sitting in a position of privilege. I ask that you take a moment to acknowledge the very real and lived experiences of the students at Santa Barbara School District, who not only have negative experiences with SROs, but are often fearful to share their stories for the very real threat of repercussion and further trauma. I ask you to not renew the SRO contract. The money that would be spent on this contract should instead be put towards real resources, such as mental health resources for students. Also, being a chemist, I know a fair amount about pyrotechnics and an M80 firecracker is orders of magnitude less loud than a howitzer round or artillery, as it was described, if we're being honest. Thank you. Thank you. The next six speakers are Rene Garcia Hernandez, Maya Barnett, Avery Boss, Noel Cabrera, Ana Garcia, Dane Lopez. Now we'll begin with Rene Garcia Hernandez. Sí, hola, ¿puedo hablar en español? Sí, claro que sí. Muchas gracias. Bueno, hola, mi nombre es Rene Garcia Hernandez y soy miembro de la comunidad y tengo el honor de trabajar con estudiantes, familias y maestros en varias maneras y de grupos diversos. Y yo también les quiero decir que estoy contra la renovación del contrato con el Departamento de Policía y espero que por favor tomen en cuenta las demandas de los estudiantes negros, de los estudiantes líderes de este esfuerzo y que en verdad centren su decisión como líderes, de este, uh, como líderes en esta decisión y de su servicio como miembros de la mesa directiva de tener escuelas santuarias, como se han dicho y escuchen a los jóvenes y tomen acción en hacer este cambio muy necesario. No renoven el contrato de policía, por favor. Y hoy tengo el honor también de contar un testimonio de un estudiante. Como un estudiante inmigrante, me da muchísimo miedo ir a la escuela, porque no sé si regresaré a mi casa. En mi escuela hay un policía que siempre me, me mira de manera diferente y en veces me, me persiga a casa después de mi ensayo de música. Yo no, te, yo no hago nada malo y no me siento seguro. En veces ni me puedo enfocar en el estudio porque el policía está presente. No entiendo mucho de, esta, de este sistema educativo, pero hay muchísimo que tiene que hacer el distrito para que todo estudiante se sienta seguro. Como estudiante de piel oscura y indocumentado, no me siento seguro. Mi familia tampoco no, es, no asiste a cosas de familia en la escuela porque policías están presentes. Hasta en, en evento de la Escuela Franklin para recursos inmigratorios estuvieron tres carros de policía. No nos sentimos cómodos ni seguros de ir a recibir los recursos de, 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 que existen. Les suplico, por favor, no acepten tener policías en las escuelas. De nuevo, no al contrato del, del Departamento de Policía. Gracias y buenas noches. 
Gracias. Our next speaker is Maya Barnett. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. My name is Maya Barnett. I am a professor in the Graduate School of Education at UCSB and a licensed clinical psychologist. I do research and practice that focuses on making sure that children receive evidence-based services that promote resiliency and reduce trauma and disparities. With these areas of expertise, I look at the issue of the SROs on campus. First, as you've heard from many speakers, there is no evidence for SROs making students or schools safer. The evidence that we do have is that SROs increase the school to prison pipeline for students of color, therefore promoting trauma instead of resiliency. Listening to youth, providing them with the services they need for their mental health, respecting the amazing leadership they have shown through the Youth Coalition, that is how you promote resiliency. Santa Barbara is not a unique outlier from national data. We have extreme overrepresentation of, of youth of color in our juvenile justice system. Systemic change is needed to impact these disparities. These changes cannot be made by tinkering on the edges with trainings of SROs or changing their roles slightly. The board must follow the lead of the Youth Coalition and vote no on the contract to have an SRO. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Avery Voss. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, my name is Avery Voss, and I ask that you do not renew this contract. As a licensed clinical psychologist in Santa Barbara who worked with many youth in the SBUSD, I'm committed to making schools an equitable place of safety and learning for all students. As a white person in this community, I want to use my voice to speak out against funding and services that bring disproportionate harm to our BIPOC students and to uplift their experiences. While the intent of bringing SROs into schools may have been to create a safer environment, there, there are, according to a congressional research report, quote, no studies with adequate methodology to establish effectiveness of SROs in increasing school safety. In contrast, there is ample data that demonstrates that the actual impact of such an approach has more harmful consequences, specifically that placing law enforcement in schools results in an increase of opportunities for negative interactions between youth and police and increase in youth being referred to the juvenile justice system, as we've heard from many speakers tonight. Importantly, these negative interactions and outcomes are also not equal across all of our students. We know that, for example, in the 2018-2019 school year, the Santa Barbara County School District suspended students at an alarmingly unequal rate. 2.4% of white students, 4% of Latinx students, and 7.9% of Black students were suspended. I urge the school district to consider alternative, more effective approaches to supporting safety in our schools. I am making the plea, along with so many other voices here this evening, that the school board does not renew their contract with the sheriff's department and instead allocates those funds to hiring individuals focused on building peace and connection for all students. These funds could support additional mental health personnel, a school teacher focused on advancing conflict resolution or restorative justice and conflict resolution, resolution programs. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Noel Cabrera. Good evening. My name is Noel Cabrera. I'm a sophomore at San Marcos High School and a part of the Cops Off Campus Youth Coalition. I am asking you as the people who make decisions for us students to not renew the San Marcos Student Resource Deputies contract. Over the past couple of months, I've had the privilege to meet with many of you on this subject, and I acknowledge and appreciate the progress that has been made in terms of only having the SRD on the perimeter of campus. However, police presence on the perimeter of campus is still a police presence at school. The policing system has a long history of being racist, ableist, classist, homophobic, and overall harmful to minorities. The district should not support having someone who is a part of such a harmful system on campus with so many students of color, LGBTQ plus students, and students with disabilities. There is no evidence to show that having a police officer on campus actually improves safety. And as a student in your school district, I do not feel safe in the learning environment knowing that there is an armed deputy nearby. I would also like to acknowledge that my being able to make public comment tonight comes from a place of privilege and I hope that you listen to the many testimonies the Youth Coalition has collected from students and to the many voices here tonight because they may not be the voices you typically hear from. 
I ask you to be mindful of who the students you typically hear from are because being able to speak out about your experiences and being heard does come from a place of privilege. Being able to feel safe at school with an armed deputy on campus comes from a place of privilege as well. I'm asking you to please listen to these underrepresented student voices and not support the renewal of the San Marcos SRD's contract. We hope the money can be put towards supporting student mental health and healing instead. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Ana Garcia. Yeah, hi. So what I gathered from the presentation that Dr. Wade Wagnick um, shared tonight is that there's absolutely no need for SRDs. Every instance that was named uh, was resolved without SRD presence. As you have heard over and over tonight, SRDs literally do nothing to actually increase the safety and clearly do everything to negatively impact the experiences of the most vulnerable students. Consider whose are not present here and why. Uh, as their choice to remain anonymous for the comments that were shared um, and that they named, they don't feel safe. It is your responsibility to create safe learning environments for students. And I cannot fathom how you will justify spending this amount of money on keeping law enforcement to police students on school campuses instead of providing more adequate mental health and other support resources that will help students be cared for and to thrive. You have the opportunity to align your budget with your values of equity that y'all use to get elected, invest in our students, listen to the youth coalition and the many constituents that have called in today and defund law enforcement presence on campus immediately. Thank you. Next speaker is Dane Lopez. Hello, my name is Dan Lopez. I'm a community member speaking tonight in solidarity, solidarity with our local youth coalition, asking you to reconsider the continued funding of a school resource deputy at San Marcos High. To add to the testimonies shared by the youth coalition, I wanna specifically talk about the results of research done by another school district in regards to school safety. After a tragic event on one of their campuses, the Toronto District School Board undertook an intensive study to investigate how they could make their campuses safer for the entire school community. After many months of speaking with students, teachers, and staff, they opted for solutions that did not involve police on campus. They noted that discipline measures involving law enforcement often cause long-term harm to the students involved and the presence of law enforcement negatively affected the relationship between students and teachers and staff. Instead, the study recommended solutions like increased funding for the hiring of social workers and therapists for better access to mental health resources, the implementation and funding of student-led conflict resolution programs and peer education programs, and anti-racist staff development for all teachers and administration staff so they can better build positive relationships with students. I hope you will take this and other research, research to heart. I hope you will listen to the many testimonies of our students shared tonight. Please reconsider renewing the contract for funding this SRD position, even in, in its amended form, and instead direct that funding to the resources that will foster the health and success of all students. Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker is Jamie Sawyer. Oh, I, I finish up. Well, thank you very much, board. Um, I'm a member of the community. I live in proximity to the high school and I stand with the um, Youth Coalition and so many speakers that you've heard from tonight in asking you not to renew the contract, especially with our sheriff's office or having any SRD at San Marcos High School or on any other school in our district. Um, the research you've heard again and again proves that SROs do not keep school campuses safe. And in fact, uh, you, you've also heard from the testimony of so many of the students that increases the chances that students will have unnecessarily negative interactions with police, both unnecessary and negative um, in these interactions. Um, it's going to increase, it increases the number of youths who are referred to juvenile justice system for nonviolent crimes. It should also be obvious that the president, presence of an SRO has disproportionately negative effect on students of color, contributing to the school to prison pipeline. Like so many people have called before me tonight and wrote in these emails, 
I ask you to think about other ways to use this money that could better benefit more of the students on our campus. An armed police presence is really not what anybody needs. And even on the perimeter, what is the difference between the situations where these people will be called in versus actually having to call the police because there really is a crisis situation where a life is in danger, which is the only time that they should be called. Thank you very much for reconsidering um, what you do with our, our our dollars for the students at the school. Thank you. President Ford, we have one more um, speaker. Dylan Griffith. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Sorry about that. I accidentally uh, lowered my hand and didn't realize as soon as you said last speaker, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Anyways, my name is Dylan Griffith. I'm a community member here in Santa Barbara. Uh, I work with countless youth who have been criminalized in school settings, and I have for the last several years uh, through my workplace, which is Freedom for Youth, a local nonprofit um, specifically supporting youth who have been impacted by our justice system, um, the vast majority of whom have been impacted directly by incarceration. Uh, I vehemently support the youth coalition and ask you to discontinue entirely the contract uh, with uh, the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office and to replace that with mental health services, specifically ones that are curated for people who are most impacted by policing, as has been stated earlier. The school district needs to hold itself accountable for its role in the school to prison pipeline. And this doesn't just include the school resource deputy, this includes school board members, teachers, staff, administrators. Um, some other statistics that I wanna to bring to light as a manifestation of the school to prison pipeline and its connection with racism systemically and specifically white supremacy as a whole is 94% of youth on probation currently are black, brown, or Asian. And there are zero white youth in our entire county who are incarcerated. There's not a single white child who is incarcerated. So again, the majority of these students have been criminalized in their schools, the ones that are impacted um, by our justice system. And school is um, essentially one of the primary key points um, or the first key points in which that impact happens. So again, I stand with the Youth Coalition in discontinuing this contract um, and to replace those services and those uh, harms that the Sheriff's Office is perpetuating with mental health services, specifically ones curated for people who are most impacted by policing. Thank you. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much to the members of the public who called in and also to Ms. Trujillo. Board members, um, uh, we know the many, many concerns that have been raised tonight. We know the many concerns that were raised in email. And uh, as you consider your comments and questions tonight, I'd love for you to let uh, Dr. Maldonado and her staff know any uh, continuing questions or concerns that you have. I also want to let you know that I am going to make a motion to not renew the contract for the SRRD tonight. And so um, I don't know if I'll have a second, but I thought you should know that ahead of time. Board members. Just a Take clarification me. though, you're not making that motion this evening. I am. Uh, oh, but we- I thought we pulled it for we pulled it. discussion only. Well, we did, but I don't see any reason that it can't become an action item. Good by me. Yes, uh, uh, Dawson. Okay, uh, I would say that, um, well, first of all, I have a few questions for Dr. Wagoneck, but I know that I don't feel comfortable. I don't think I have enough information to give an informed vote tonight. Uh, I don't know if other board members agree with me, but I do think it's important to outreach to all student groups. Um, before, before I ask my questions, I guess I can make a few comments. Uh, I am a white cisgender male and that comes with a lot of privilege. And I think my comments tonight, that should be considered. Um, and I am a student at San Marcos High School. And today and throughout the week, I spoke to a lot of students in person and um, I found that regardless of their background, a lot of students that I talked to firsthand did feel more comfortable with an SRD, SRD on campus. So I know, um, yeah, a lot of the voices shared tonight did not feel comfortable, but 
I think it is important that we also include their opinions. So um, with my questions, uh, I know a lot of students were like concerned about like interacting with an SRD. So I was wondering um, when would an SRD be required to interact with students directly in case of conflict? That really depends on the situation and it really depends on the administrator and um, the principal who is the leader of the school and how they choose to utilize law enforcement on their campus. I will tell you that, um, and I know we're late into this evening, but I was an assistant principal at Santa Barbara High for three years. We did not have an SRO at that time. That forced us mm -hmm. to use other methods and really only call law enforcement when it was truly an issue of um, safety and crimes on campus. Since that time, I have worked with SROs on campus, but I think that having that experience of not having one helped me understand my role as an administrator and as a principal. And so I think it really just depends. Um, certainly, when there is a severe crime that's been committed, one, one individual talked about a sexual assault. That's one I bring up a lot. Those sorts of things have to be investigated. A, a high school in our town, a, a traditional high school, is like a small town, and the principal is like the mayor. And so the climate and the culture is impacted by the tone that the principal sets and how they utilize law enforcement on their campus. And then, um, well, I guess this is similar, but we're, if this were to be passed, uh, the um, as SRD would be working at the perimeter. How will that affect students seeing the SRD? Will that change how often they see? In the way that I am imagining it, the students would see the SRD when they're coming and going from campus, coming onto campus, leaving campus. And we know that juniors and seniors are at San Marcos are allowed to leave campus. So if they pass by the SRD and they are in their uh, vehicle or on, on the perimeter sidewalk, then that's when they would see them. They would also see them if that deputy was called onto campus um, because of one of the reasons that I'm talking about. If a student comes in and reports, um, we'll keep going with the sexual assault because that is one that comes up every year multiple times uh, in our high schools. That's the reality of our society. They would come onto campus to interview the victim. Then an individual would see them in the office is what I would imagine. I do need to say that for the first time this year, uh, Santa Barbara High School does not have an SRO on campus. They have a different model where they they call the, the uh, community uh, liaison officers in. So they have a different model and they do not have SROs on campus this year. Uh, okay, thank you. And just to close off my comments, after speaking to students and being a member of San Marcos ASB, as well as a student at San Marcos, I have heard very mixed opinions on this issue. Uh, I do think we need more time to outreach and understand not only the issues that come with this, but also what students perceive as the SRD, because I know a lot of them didn't even know we had one. So uh, I, I do think it's important to spend more time considering, but I mean, it's up to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Caps. Well, thank you uh, to all of our speakers and to so many people who reached out um, over the last uh, several weeks. And thank you to President Ford for making that motion. I wholeheartedly support it as much as um, 
Dr. Wagnick, I appreciate where you're coming from and Dr. Maldonado by bringing this forward. I, I don't believe that the contract should be renewed. Uh, I've heard the experiences loud and clear. The research supports the fact that SROs disproportionately harm uh, students of color. Uh, we've heard personal experiences from students and it just is heartbreaking to hear that some are afraid to speak even to the board uh, for fear of retaliation. That just, I, I wish there was words that I could say uh, to reassure that that's not the case, but I understand that, that I'm not the messenger for that. I just do wanna talk about the fact that uh, as a speaker said, we do have a dual pandemic and Dr. Maldonado has often used that terminology as well and the systemic racism and the fact that as much as we have also a challenge of gun violence in this country, especially bizarrely and perversely targeting our students, there is just not enough evidence that the presence of the SRO prevents that kind of gun violence. And in particular, I was moved by the, the statement from Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense, um, who came out against this contract today and emailed us and reiterated, this is one of the pr premier groups that there is causing, calling for gun safety across America. And their, their local chapter here in Santa Barbara is wonderful and so active and an entity that I've relied on, especially as we've dealt with um, gun violence and threats in our schools. And they are uh, solidly against uh, the presence, presence of SROs on campus, again, citing evidence that if anything, uh, it might, they might incite more of a threat. And so that really just, um, along with the experiences and the passion and the commitment of our students, our black student youth, uh, our groups, the student coalition, the youth coalition, so many entities and so many individuals who've reached out. I just, it's not something that I can support going forward. I do wanna remember that two years ago, the black student youth did support the presence of, of a SRO. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe they were pressured, but certainly I don't have the full story, but the way that it was expressed to me is that, again, there was just a lot of concerns about gun safety and that was the reason. And I think we just know more now and we're in a different place in our country's history in our community's history. And these experiences of fear and discrimination and systemic racism are too important for this, for me as a board member to continue along in the status quo. And so therefore I support the, uh, the motion that President Ford has made. Thank you. Mrs. Moten, please. Thank you. Let me first just say to, to the students that I am sorry And I sincerely apologize for the continued feelings of not feeling safe and the mental stress that it continues to cause. We, we have sit up here and we, can, we talk about it and it's not from a lack of caring. I think it's for new information that's coming along. I was just thinking about this and we came on this board January, 2017. The first one after we got installed, one of the first things that we did was to pass a resolution to make sure that our immigrant students and their families felt safe to come here. The second thing where, where we were talking about equitable things, where we we're talking about racism, we took that action. That's one instance. Just as Ms. Capp said, the black student demands, we had an opportunity there to do there. I don't think we went far enough because they're asked us to remove it but we were trying to figure out how best to do that. And we were taking that information. And here we are again, talking about inequity, feelings of not being safe, mental stress as a part of that. 
I just want to thank all for the emails that came and the comments there tonight. And I'm glad that we moved it off of action, although I'm supportive of, of the motion. But I'm glad we moved it off action because I was not going to support that. Because we cannot continue to go forth when we have the opportunity to reimagine, rethink campus safety and the folks that we're trying to keep safe. As I said back in 2018, Safety and safety are two different things, but we should not have to let it get to this point again before we really are hearing about what it means. I just, this is just very emotional right now. I have a son who went to, through this district. There are many stories that aren't told, but people are afraid to do it. But at this moment, in this third opportunity that we have to reimagine, rethink, reformate, a campus safety that says we're going to be open, we're going to be equitable. In fact, when we there wasn't the funding for the San Marcos SRO, equity was one of the things that we talked about because other campuses had it. That's why we went along with it. But we have got to be willing to say, and I think that we are, to make sure that when we have campus safety it is one that the lines of communications are open. It creates respect. And it has the opportunity to hear from those who are impacted the closest. It's, it's so important to hear from, from those who are impacted the most about it. Mm -hmm. We can read data that can tell you something, but there's always a person behind that data. And we cannot lose sight of that. So I just think this is an opportunity for us to really get in front of this. And thankfully that we have an op an op another opportunity to get it right, because we now know better we can do better. So I, I, I support this, but I really want when we reimagine what campus safety is going to look like, it needs to be consistent across all high schools in what we do and how we do it. Because I, I got to tell you, I don't want to have to come to this and still hear that our students are stressing the way they are stressing, mm -hmm. afraid to come and tell us when we say it's open, mm -hmm. come tell us what you need. Mm -hmm. They've told us, but we haven't always met that need. And I think this is the opportunity that we need to step up and do what we need to do. We've done that. We've done that in the <clears throat> face of people saying no. We just did it by mandating vaccines to keep our students safe. We just did it. So this is no less important and we need to do it now. So I, again, I am so sorry. And I apologize to those students who have now left this district and some brothers and sisters who are still here that we have the chance tonight to get it right. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sims uh, Ms. Munoz, please. Yes, um, thank you also, um, Ms. Sims Moten. Um, I also have a real concern about this, just the SRO on campus. Um, and I truly respect the Youth Coalition for coming and having their activism and organizing about this topic. And I think as a board for us to have the courage to take a stand and to be consistent. You know, we did it, it what can I say? We have numerous emails and I agree with them that we looked at like disciplinary practices and the restorative approach, but we didn't go far enough in terms of having an SRO on our campus. I think it's the, it's the time it's, you know, Lord, um, 30 years ago when my kids were, you know, were, um, were little and then when they were old enough to understand, I told them to stay beyond, you know, under that radar um, because once they got singled out, I knew what was going to happen. Um, I've seen it. I've seen it with, you know, nephews, with nieces and so forth and with students that I've advocated for. When I went to San Marcos, I don't know how many times to the high school I had, you um, clients that were young, young moms with their kids. And they, their anxiety was, was not about their situation, about their boyfriend, this and that. No, it was when we saw an officer and stuff. And so to try to, to look at it now, you know, like I said, I mean, this is like, you know, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, and so forth, and here we are in 2021, where we can take a stand. Other school districts in bigger city, big cities, um, 
smaller cities and such have taken the stand. So I also, I, I agree with it. Um, the funds and energy that we're using, all these students and parents that, and community members that are staying up until you know past 10 to look at what we're gonna do, right? They're all watching. Um, and I think all that energy we could use in a very much more positive way, you know, look at like mental health support, look at the security, having our students feel safe. It shouldn't matter if they're documented or not. It shouldn't matter if they're of color. You know, it shouldn't matter what their gender identity is. They need to feel safe. And that's the only way that I see. And it was my original reason to be on this board was because of the pain that I saw with students in so many different ways. We could have better communication. We could look at the stress in their lives, in their home and so forth. We shouldn't add to it. We should we shouldn't add to the stress. We should be a positive impact for our students and know that they are heard. Not, oh, I'm hearing you, but you know, know that we are hearing them and that we're gonna take a stand. Thank you. And Ms. Alvarez, please. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the report. As uh, uh, so you know, I sent several questions ahead of time because I felt that the information I had received wasn't complete. <clears throat> I, I was looking for the correlation. I was looking for the numbers and it just did not make sense to me. So that's why I was asking additional questions. In addition to that, when I, when I say the 1,440 hours that are being proposed at 106.25 per hour, I started thinking, I really disseminated this information. Believe me, I actually lost sleep over this. And I asked myself, why? Why are we talking about hiring a law enforcement officer at a school? If we were, if we were building a school from scratch today, starting from ground zero, is this something that we would add into our plan? Is this something that we would put into our budget? And if, if the answer is yes, then why is that? If the answer is no, why is that? And why is it that this proposal being brought forward doesn't include alternatives? I, I want to know what alternatives we have. We have $160,000 that we're talking about. How about if we talk about student engagement, if we talk about conflict resolution, if we talk about clubs, activities, uh, if uh, we say to Dr. Glaser, Dr. Glaser, we know you need help because I think they do need help. I don't wanna lose sight of that. I think the school admin and, and th their support, I think they're spread as thin as they could be. So I think this money should be spent in a way that we provide assistance to Dr. Glaser and her team in a different way, in a way that we provide support to what the students need, the mental health. I know that recently I was trying to remember what, what additional positions we have hired. And I know that we have hired youth outreach workers, have we not? We have hired crisis counselors and we have MTSS. So we're already addressing some of those issues, but as it's been clearly made tonight, it's not enough. We need to do more. In addition to that, I don't believe that we're throwing caution to the wind. We have, don't, we have campus support, uh, I don't know what they're called at the schools, but don't we have campus support supervisors or at every school that they actually could patrol the area. I mean, don't we have yes. those services in place already? We do. Okay. We do. So what I like to add to, doc, to Dr. Ford's motion <laughs> is that we allocate this money for San Marcos, for Dr. Glacier, to get some kind of support. I, I don't know if that's a Dean of Student Engagement family engagement, where they build relationships, where they make home visits, where they get to know the students. An email that just came a few minutes ago, I don't know if the rest of the board re received it, but this is a former student from those Pueblos High School. And the student is saying, 
I, I, I did not feel any more safe as a student for four years at Dos Pueblos High School because of law enforcement. I feel safe because my counselor, Jeff Sofro, allowed me to miss class to tell him about a friend who was struggling and go on, and she goes on and on. And also because Scott Gutentag, who greeted everyone, walked the hall and were present all over campus. I felt safe in high school, safe in high school because of adults who saw me, noticed me, and listened to me, who knew my name, who invested time in forming a relationship with me. How about if we do that with that $160,000? Let's give Dr. Glacier a, a, an FTE, a position that will support her and her staff and focuses on building relationship with the students. That's what I would like to the motion that we spend that money to help San Marcos have some kind of family engagement, student engagement, something. Dr. Maldonado can work with Dr. Fraser to get this. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanna make a couple of comments. First of all, I've learned a lot uh, from each of the comments that you made and uh, I don't think that any of the members of the board are actually saying that we think our schools are 100% safe or that um, an officer makes 100% of a difference. I also wanted the board to know that my experience is with student resource officers that are not law enforcement officers. And so my motion will include a, a recognition that there are need to be people on campus working very closely with students on the very uh, problems that contribute to a negative learning environment or to negative um, experiences for students. But it, for me, honestly, it just doesn't need to be a law enforcement person. So if you will indulge me, this is my motion. I would like to make a motion to not, oh, Dawson, please. Yeah, uh, I would just like to make a few comments if that's okay. Of course. Um, okay. So I do think it's important that I myself reflect and after hearing your comments uh, and really thinking through what the speaker said today and what I have heard uh, from all of my constituents, especially at my high school, um, I've, my position is to advocate for the safety of the students that I represent. And I see this now as an immediate safety that is being threatened with an SRD on campus. So one of my biggest concerns is immediate safety. And I do believe that President Ford's um, proposal, along with um, Ms. Alvarez's amendment addition to it is a way to allow for the um, pain that these students have endured to be alleviated. Um, with that being said, I have been an advocate for mental health for all of my time on this board. And I do think that we need to emphasize support of admin because with this SRD um, not having their contract be renewed, admin, admin will be even more spread thin. So it's important that we give them the support we need, as Ms. Alvarez said. Um, so they are, uh, not put under more stress. So, uh, yeah. And I, I think with moving forward, we need to include the opinions of the students that didn't, that wanted an SRD on campus and still make them feel safe without this contract being renewed. So I thank you guys for listening to me. I really appreciate that. And, and that's, I think that that's a great point to make is that we want to make sure that we understand what students, all students think they need in order to feel safe. And uh, clearly for a number of students, it's not a law enforcement officer, but that there are other issues on campus, including the, uh, the burden that school administrators face. So I would now seeing that there are no further comments, like to make the following motion. I make the motion to not renew the contract for an SRD at San Marcos High School and to direct a district staff to reimagine, reallocate funds and create better alternatives and solutions at all three high schools 
for addressing issues on campus that negatively affect learning, such as poor attendance, personal or family involvement with alcohol, tobacco and drugs, or bullying, harassment, or other types of violence. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Caps. All in favor of this motion, please indicate by saying aye and raising your hand. Can I? Aye. I'm sorry, may, may I say a comment before the vote? Yes. I, I like to specify that this 154,771 be allocated specifically to San Marcos. Is that possible? Uh, let me clarify that this contract expired in July, so it's not that full amount. If, I, if I'm yeah, correct, I, Dr. Wagenek, we do need to pay up until the point that we release that. So it's not exactly that amount. I'd like to keep that open if possible. I, okay, I like to have an update of what the balance is after that, because if we're paying 140, uh, 1625 per hour, and we're going to pay obviously whatever's been worked. So that would be September and October. So they should, there should be a good significant amount left. I want to make sure that Dr. Glaser gets help and that this money is allocated specifically so that she gets help. We can, uh, we can ensure that we, look at the balance uh, that is left over and send a report to the board. Great, thank you. And, and include uh, a position type yes. to help with this issue. Yes, thank you. Keeping in mind, it can be called a student resource officer, just doesn't need to be a law enforcement person. Please, Mrs. Munoz. I, um, just an additional comment to that would be the impact, you know, thinking about the three schools. Um, I did say all three. Okay, Dos Pueblos, mm -hmm. San Marcos, and Santa Barbara. Okay, yes, so, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Ms. Just, Smoten, please. Thank you. And just one last, one last comment to, at least for me, <laughs> um, just in terms <laughs> of, <laughs> so allocating that to San Marcos in terms, again, looking at it through a different lens, not just throwing another position here. Not, I'm not suggesting that you're saying that, but really looking at it through a different lens. How are we going to reimagine, rethink campus safety? And what does that look like before we allocate it to one, one point or another. Absolutely, I stole your word, reimagine, and put it in the motion. Okay, seeing no further comments, I'd like to call for a motion, uh, call the motion and call for a vote. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, board members, uh, first of all, we are going to postpone uh, the report on um, expanding rigorous opportunities for students. We are going to postpone the report on the governance handbook. I would ask you to please uh, look at that very carefully. Ms. Alvarez and I did our best to capture as many thoughts as we thought were important for us. Um, and please get back to us if you have any concerns about it, we would like to pass it very soon in the future. So the only remaining issues for us are the three student uh, action items. And I would like to go back to number four action item. This is the approval of the Interdistrict Transfer Appeal Case 202122-T12. This item was discussed and considered in closed session since it involves a student. And so I would like to ask board members may have a motion to improve to approve the transfer appeal for 202122-T12. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Alvarez. And a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. All in favor, signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. On to number five. The fifth action item from earlier tonight is the approval of student discipline based on Ed Code 48918, Case 202122-02. This item was also discussed and considered in closed session since it involves a student. And so board members may have a motion to approve the uh, student discipline action based on code Ed Code 48918, Case 202122-02. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten, and a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes unanimously. And on to number six. <clears throat> this is the board action on student discipline based on Ed Code 48918, case number 202122-01. 
And this also was discussed and considered in closed session because it involves a student. Board members may have a motion to approve this student discipline um, motion, please. So moved. Thank you. And is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Caps. So all in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Thank you. Now, moving forward to the end of our agenda items, I think we've covered everything. I'd like to ask board members to please um, take a look at coming events and future agenda items and as you review them, and if you have any suggestions for us or things that you'd like to be added to either of those lists, please let us know. Our next regularly scheduled meeting is for Tuesday, October 26th at 5.30 p.m. with public participation virtually. And as we adjourn tonight, I also want to remind everyone that tomorrow is National Stop Bullying Day, a day when we should remind ourselves to keep learning about bullying and recognizing how we can all work to prevent it. I hope that many classrooms throughout our district are taking time not only to think about how to report bullying, but reflect on our responsibility to stop it before it happens. And in the words of South African human, Act, a human rights activist Desmond Tutu, he said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. We can all do better. And with that, tonight's meeting of the SBUSD School Board is adjourned at 1032. Good evening.